Good evening, everybody. Sean Tabbitt here from The Sean Tabbitt Show. Excited to have all of you join us tonight for our podcasting masterclass. Uh, the live stream just went up here as it's 7 p.m. And so i uh, going to wait a few moments before bringing Ryan on uh, while everybody gets on the stream and we get things ready to go. If you can see me, if you can hear me, uh, leave a comment. Tell me where you are joining us from and we'll get things underway here in just a few minutes. Now, this is, uh, I got to participate in one of these uh, live stream training events uh, a couple weeks back with Jamie Galloway. We did a talk about writing uh, and the book publishing process and what that looks like. And Jamie actually inspired me, actually challenged me uh, after that uh, live stream to say, hey, you should do one about podcasting. So that's what got me uh, moving down the path, uh, going, just deciding, hey, we'll, we'll do a, a pop-up masterclass all about podcasting. Uh, looking at the comments here, I see a few of my friends, Toby, joining us all the way from Decatur, Illinois. I'm guessing Toby is going to be my most nearby guest who's joining us for the live stream tonight. Uh, Beatrice, to see you. We actually talked about a new podcast for her a number of weeks back for the Destiny Image Podcast Network that Ryan's and my show are both a part of. And Beatrice is joining us all the way from Los Angeles. I'm guessing her weather is a little bit nicer uh, than mine right now. And we'll give it a few more moments here uh, just to let people uh, get logged in and, and, and set up. Uh, if, if, you've already, if you already have a podcast, uh, I'd love to see a comment uh, about what level of podcasting experience that you have. Um, tonight, we're going to do two teaching sessions uh, with a break after each of those. And then at the end, we will be doing uh, a Q&A. So as you ha have questions or things you're thinking of along the way while Ryan and I are sharing, uh, write those down, and then in the last segment, uh, Ryan and I will tag team answering your questions. Uh, we got Waylon joining us all the way from Dallas, a friend of mine and a friend of Ryan's. So, welcome, Waylon. Oh, I see my buddy John all the way from Dallas. Good to see you, my friend. Congratulations, man! It's been a year since your book came out. Uh, that's a big milestone. Uh, if you want to listen to my interview uh, with John Arroyo, you can find that in my podcast archives. So welcome, John. And I'm actually going to bring Ryan into the live stream here as well. Ryan, how's it going, buddy? Very well. Very, very well. Honored to be here with you and everyone else that is jumping on. And we will let a few more people here get in. Well, we will start at 7.05. And uh, the other folks, as they're joining us, uh, they will we'll get underway. Who else we got? We got Tammy joining us from Atlanta. Uh, Tammy already has a podcast, and uh, we're looking at bringing her over to the Destiny Image Podcast Network. Uh, we've got Dustin joining us from Virginia. I don't know, Dustin, but it's good to meet you, man. Uh, Anna Werner. Hello, Anna, a good friend of mine, a Destiny Image author. So, Anna, welcome to the Masterclass tonight. Thanks for being a part of it. Uh, Ryan, uh, why did you decide to join me for this podcast Masterclass? Am I just that convincing? <laughs> of course. One is uh, naturally our relationship. I will do anything in the world for those that I have a relationship with. So that's one thing. And um, just a little behind the scenes, I genuinely believe that uh, I may be the best example of what not to do in podcasting, but I think that in and of itself is going to be a great lesson for a lot of people. So <laughs> you never can tell. Well, I guess we'll, we'll try to play polar opposites of the example spectrum. Uh, Ryan's a good friend of mine. I met him when I first started working at Destiny Image, and we've just collaborated on podcasts and live streams, and we just really stay in touch on a pretty much weekly basis. And so, yeah, we're, we're just really looking for more ways for he and I to collaborate this year. Uh, we've had a, another person joining us, Kara Carr, all the way from northern Minnesota. I'm going to guess Kara beats all of us in terms of volume of snow that she has received uh, over this winter. Uh, fun fact, Kara used to be my boss. And uh, eventually I became her boss. And so, uh, and we're still friends after the fact. So funny how that works out uh, in God's providence. So Cara, thank you for joining us as well. And let's see who else we got. Tammy Sutherland, what not to do experts represent. We, <laughs> we all have to start somewhere. And, and that's just the reality of it. Uh, you know, 
for better or worse, I'm kind of uh, an OG podcaster in the Christian space. I've been at it for get close to 10 years. And, um, you know, back before podcasting was cool or you had many tools available. So uh, I got to learn a lot of things the hard way. Uh, the resources folks have available right now are a ton better uh, than what I had when I was first starting out. Uh, looks like we're getting close to our number of registrants. So uh, let's go ahead and we will kick this off. So Thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. This is our podcasting masterclass level one. Uh, we're looking to do a level two masterclass maybe in another month to get into more of the in-depth editing tips and tricks and other behind the scenes stuff that goes into making a podcast fancy. Uh, for tonight, we're going to talk about mindset, basics of what it takes to get started, uh, all the things you really need to think through to be ready to launch and be successful and just get into that place where you can uh, knock out those first 10 episodes. I always feel like in those first 10 episodes, that's where you find your voice and kind of your persona or the personality that you have behind the microphone. So but that is our plan uh, for tonight. We're going to have two teaching sessions. Each of those sessions will be followed by a brief five-ish, seven-minute break somewhere in there. Uh, and then the final session will be a Q&A uh, where you'll be able to post your questions in the comments section. And Ryan and I will take team answering those questions. So uh, as you're thinking of questions, uh, write those down or just note those. And when we get to that part of tonight's talk, uh, share those and we will do our best to answer them. So uh, let's kick this off since Ryan is my guest as we're hosting this on the Sean Tabbitt Show's page. Uh, I'm going to let him kick us off and just give an introduction. So Ryan, for the people who are meeting you for the first time, uh, give us uh, a quick intro. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, quick introduction for everybody. This is my real voice. This is not my radio voice or my podcasting voice. This is my Southern accent voice. Originally from Alabama, currently live in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. Been married this November, be 25 years. Got four children. Been in ministry for 24 years. Um, I've done it all, jack of all trades as far as ministry wise, but um, I'm also a teacher at two different schools of ministry here in Eastern Tennessee. And I am an itinerant minister. On top of all those things, I decided to get into the podcasting world and launch a podcast some time ago. And really, it's been one of the more joyful things I've ever had the opportunity or the experience uh, to really encounter. I've enjoyed talking with individuals, growing, stretching. But my podcast is The Blacksmith Chronicles. The Blacksmith Identity is something that became very important to me a number of years ago. There's a whole reason behind that. There's a whole story behind that. There's a message behind that. But each conversation for my podcast is to really have a unique conversation, something that you wouldn't typically hear on everyone else's podcast. Uh, which sometimes can make my guests feel a little uneasy because, you know, they're used to possibly having some uh, questions prepared for them in advance. We don't roll that way. Uh, we believe in pounding out a conversation, hence the blacksmith. And at the end of this, really have something that is unique to the listener and the experience of the one that is being interviewed as well. So, you know, that's kind of it in a nutshell uh, of all the things that I do. My office is in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Uh, we have a home church, Summit Church that we're part of. I administer here regularly as well. Uh, and I'm also connected with an outreach ministry that um, helps men and women get off of drugs and alcohol. It's a year-long discipleship rehabilitation facility. And so I've got my hand in a lot of things, but I am extremely grateful to say that I am a podcaster. And Sean, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this class with you. Well, and, and Ryan, I, I don't know if, if you covered this already. I must have dozed off, off for a moment, but everybody always seems to have some specific reason they got drawn into podcast or uh, they, they started podcasting. So for you, like, what was that original spark inkling? What was it that brought you into the podcasting space? Um, For me personally, I... I'm an individual that likes to be challenged. I like for my thinking to be challenged. I like for my beliefs to be challenged. I like for the process to be challenged. And there's, you know, I love a good message. I love a good Sunday morning service. I love a conference environment. I love the encouragement and, and, and you know, being hyped up and, and all those things that comes with it. But 
for me personally, I've got to have something that's going to cause me to go into a thought process. And I began to realize that I was finding that in podcasts. I travel a lot. So when you're, you know, in airports or you're on planes or you're driving many hours on the road, I wanted something that I could listen to. And one of the things for me personally, I don't download a lot of sermons. I don't listen to preachers. Uh, when I say I love you know, the sermons and the conferences, that's me being live. But I typically do not listen to sermons. And part of that is I really want to protect myself. I want to guard myself and I want to make sure that I'm not regurgitating or repeating or echoing what I heard in someone else's sermon. And I tried to make it my own. And what I found in the podcast world was I, I didn't get that. I, I, I found people having genuine conversations and they were challenging my thought process. And this is, again, this is what I love. And so I really wanted to dive into that world. I wanted to expound on that. I'm one of these individuals that listens to podcasts a lot. I'm a, uh, not only am I a podcaster, I listen to po podcasts. I, I'm constantly um, loving the, uh, the, the, the stuff, the content that's out there. And, and I'll say this too, just so that we get a little bit of clarification. I don't listen just to Christian podcasts. Uh, I again, because I enjoy being challenged, I listen to a lot of podcasts that we would characterize secular. Now, nothing filled with with language or perversion or anything like that. But I listen to a lot of stuff because I I want to know how is the world thinking, how is the world perceiving things. I want to be able to respond in a podcast episode. I want to be able to talk with a little bit of knowledge and understanding where the world may be coming from. So those challenges really draw me in to why I started podcasting, because I wanted to have that authentic and genuine conversations with myself and with other individuals, because I, I think what the world is looking, you know, Leonard Ravenhill said this, the world is not looking for another explanation of Christianity. The world is looking for the demonstration of Christianity. I love that statement, but I, I've grown in that statement and saying, I believe that the world is looking for the authenticity of those who are the sons of God. Not to give us the little, you know, real quick, you know, say this, do this, but the real authenticity. So I've learned to be a better listener. And when I've learned to be a better listener, I've learned and recognized that, that I can actually respond instead of react. So that's why I got into the podcasting world. Well, Ryan, thanks for giving us a, a whirlwind tour of your journey <laughs> into podcasting. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I, I'm assuming a lot of you know who I am. Uh, my name is Sean Tabbitt. I've got a podcast called The Sean Tabbitt Show. I've uh, been in the Christian publishing space for, uh, I suppose it's been about a decade now. Cut my teeth in the Christian space, uh, working at a bookstore uh, back in college where I met my wife, which maybe that's why I fell in love with the Christian publishing industry, because I met my wife working at a Christian bookstore. Uh, but I've had a range of different jobs, worked for three different major trade publishers, and uh, the Christian publishing space is my life. I love serving and uh, being in this environment. Uh, I love collaborating with authors and, and leaders. And I just consider it a privilege to do what I get to do. I, I wake up and work with some of my very best friends in the whole world every day. And so I just really appreciate the stage that I am in. Uh, as far as my podcasting journey, ironically enough, I wanted to get into podcasting because I thought it would be easier. Uh, back in the day uh, when blogging was still more of a thing, I used to write lots of book reviews uh, after I was done with grad school and just looking for a way to keep reading and writing. Uh, I got into the book review scene for a number of years and got kind of bored with that. And so I thought, hey, I'll, I'll start a podcast because that, that'll be more fun and maybe it'll be easier. It'll be something different. Uh, I don't know if I would say doing a podcast is easier than doing book reviews, but that was, you know, as, as Ryan would say, nevertheless, that was how my journey got started. And so I've been in the podcasting space for nine, 10 years, thereabouts. I've had uh, three different shows, and my current show, The Sean Tabbitt Show, 
It's had a good run. We're getting close to 600 episodes. And uh, people always ask me, how many interviews have you done uh, throughout your time podcasting? And I'm probably somewhere between 800 to 900 interviews that I've done through the years. And so I have done quite a few interviews talking about books in the past uh, nine, 10 years, and yet uh, I still don't get bored. And so um, I would say for me, uh, I've got some different reasons why I got into podcasting. Uh, Public speaking was certainly not something I was super comfortable with. So podcasting was an easy way uh, for me to get behind a microphone and just get more comfortable talking with people. Uh, I would say kind of finding my voice and just working to overcome some level of shyness. Uh, A lot of people who, who know me professionally wouldn't have thought that I was shy or quiet, uh, although that was something I've had to work hard uh, to overcome through the years. And, um, you know, probably probably the biggest thing, too, uh, not unlike Ryan, um, I like to stretch myself and challenge myself to get outside of the, I always describe it, the Christian bubble that I work and live within uh, often. Uh, just, just to connect with uh, folks outside of the Christian space, I listen to a broad range of podcasts. Uh, even on my show, my content's probably about 80%. 70% Christian content, and then uh, 20 to 30% mainstream. So I'll talk to personal development uh, authors or business marketing authors, leaders, that sort of thing. So I like to mix it up. Um, what, what's been fun for me, and, and this might be something to think about if you're if you're looking to start a podcast, is um, could it be a, I don't know if I want to say a ministry opportunity, but an opportunity to, although it turns into one actually, uh, an opportunity to step outside of your normal space and just learn what it's like to articulate, walk out your faith, and talk to people who might not have the same background as you, might have zero Christian uh, experience or, or knowledge. That's probably been the the most fun part to me, just to talk to people from all different kinds of uh, faith and backgrounds. And uh, just it's 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 been fun to learn how to communicate and express myself uh, with folks that are outside of the uh, the Christian bubble. So definitely been a really good growth experience for me. Um, in terms of doors that podcasting has opened for me, uh, I've gotten speaking opportunities at conferences. I've gotten to be on TV a number of times. Uh, podcasting has been a prominent uh, prominent part of several of my last few job opportunities. So, you know, being at it for a decade, uh, it's a long time. Uh, I've met lots of interesting people. My network has expanded dramatically. Uh, and so God's just used it in a lot of unexpected ways, a lot of really fun ways. Uh, and when I started, I never would have thought that podcasting would have become such an important part of my life. But but here we are, where I'm I'm podcasting uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, one one funny story uh, before we move on. I remember back in 2013, I went to what was at that point called uh, the International Christian Retail Show or ICRS. Uh, so 2013 in St. Louis. And I knocked out like 13 or 18 podcast interviews in three days, which is kind of insane. Uh, But I remember sitting down with authors and recording interviews at this show. And the majority of them were like, what's a podcast? You know, or so this this isn't on radio or TV. Like, where where do I find this? And so uh, it's really interesting to look back and think from 2013 to today what can change? Uh, You know, back then podcasting was an emerging space and now it's just everywhere on almost any imaginable device. So uh, there's been a lot of growth uh, in in the the eight, nine years that I've been in the podcasting space. So uh, one last comment I'll make in terms of shift of impact. So last year we had people consuming media differently. So uh, a lot of people were stuck at home uh, doing lots of consuming on their computers and, and their devices. And uh, just this is more just an anecdotal comment, but as I look at book sales and impact of media opportunities last year, what I began to notice is some of our YouTube partners, friends that have significant YouTube followings, friends that have significant podcasts, I started to see last year where those podcasts and YouTube shows impacted retail sales sometimes more than uh, a traditional TV appearance. And that was the first time I'd seen it at that scale. Uh, my my favorite example, uh, and I'm, I won't name any names, but uh, a friend of mine, his show, he had an author on. We featured it in Destiny Images channel. We featured the interview, obviously, in his channel. Uh, collectively, those two videos uh, had over a million views and moved 3,000 plus books in the trade in uh, six weeks following those interviews. And that was really the only uh, promotion going on for that book uh, during that time period. So uh, just an example of how there was a shift last year and we saw podcasting and live streaming video. Uh, making a different, uh, a bigger impact than we'd ever seen before. Uh, let, let's talk briefly now about if whether or not there is room to actually get into podcasting. I'm going to bring Ryan into this. I don't know if you'll have any comments for this, but 
that is okay. Um, I've done a, a number of talks, as I said earlier, at, at a few different conferences. And so I have some statistics I pulled. Uh, one of the things when people are thinking about podcasting is they'll be like, is, is there is there room? Uh, you know, podcasting seems to be a bloated space. Uh, one, A couple of things I want you to think about. Uh, 51% of Americans 12 or older have listened to a podcast. Uh, and these statistics are about a year old. Uh, so think of that half Half of the country, 12 or older, has listened to a podcast. Uh, that's a lot of potential people that could be connecting with your message, connecting with your uh, content, if you will. Uh, 22%, and I'm sure that this is much higher now, listen to podcasts each week. Uh, so just, again, if you start trying to do the math of 22% of everybody in this country consumes uh, at least one podcast every week. And then uh, two-thirds of all podcast consumers are listening on a mobile device. So you really need to think through uh, always being very mobile friendly. Uh, for for the authors out there, there's also a high correlation between podcast listeners uh, and audiobook subscribers or audiobook listeners. So people who like to consume interviews and uh, audio content also like to uh, listen to audiobooks as well. So that's an, an interesting correlation. Uh, the podcasting space, while I'll, I will say I don't feel like the growth is unlimited, uh, I feel like there's still an awful lot of room, uh, just just like any other channel, YouTube, your blog, whatever it might be. You're looking to find a niche. You're looking to find uh, a group of fans that you can connect with and be with for the long haul. And so uh, you'll be able to carve out uh, your own space of fans in your podcast or your live streaming show, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, we could reach a place where podcasts becomes too bloated, uh, but I think we've got many more years of podcasting growth. Uh, and we'll get into find your why here in a moment. Um, I find people tend to fade out or as they call it, pod fade after a year or two. And, and, and in all honesty, I've had times where I've taken a break for you know six months uh, just during job changes and other shifts uh, through the years. And so sometimes you put your podcast down for a while and take a break and then you pick the baton back up again and start running. Uh, but, you know, even though we had a lot of people jump into podcasting in the past three years because it was the popular thing to do, you know, I, I think you'll see some of those folks fall by the wayside. It's a rare person who will be at podcasting or any kind of media creation for five years, eight years, 10 years. Uh, it's a long haul. Uh, it's a lot of work. So just a few thoughts on why podcasting is still a growth space. Uh, I'm going to pitch this question over to Ryan and I'll comment on it as well. Uh, Ryan, what is a podcast anyways these days? You know, I, I think when I started out and probably when you started out, it was mostly audio. At least I know what my original content was. And it's gotten a lot more complex in terms of video content. But um, for you, when you were starting out, were you doing only audio or were you doing video right out of the gate? No, in the beginning, it was strictly audio. Um, I mean, it was it was as simple as it could possibly be, even in the early days of having guests. Now here's the funny thing about it. Uh, I would actually take my cell phone and I would have a guest in on the phone and I would set my cell phone. I would, I didn't have this microphone at the time, but I would position that cell phone to feed into from the speaker of the phone into the mic as well. And so in my early podcast, you can hear, how that really sounds like an old school radio program, which ironically, I actually love the sound of it. Um, I'm a little bit of a nostalgic guy, but that's one of the things that I had to do in the early days. And it, there, there came the process where we get introduced, uh, Zoom becomes more popular, Skype becomes more popular, other different formats that would give you this opportunity to actually have a video chat that would record the audio and it become better. And it just became um, basically killing two birds with one stone because when you got the audio, you also got the video. So for me, it gave the duality of, well, let's present the video. So the video is something that is different in the sense that we do put up graphics. When, when I edit it, we get more information out why an individual is watching the, the video. But the video really, because of what we went through last year, the video is giving people something a little bit extra because they're at home. They're looking for something to watch. You know, maybe uh, they're Internet streamers and they have uh, YouTube on their TV or YouTube TV, whatever. And they can actually pull it up and watch it on their uh, home TV screen. And so that's been an extra bonus. But it originally it wasn't 
the intent. It just became, oh, wow, I can do this. And it morphed in to be what it is. So, again, if you go back to the early days, it sounds scratchy at best uh, through the, the, the sound quality. And I've definitely come a lot better, a lot further. Uh, I have a better microphone these days and, of course, better computer, better software. So it is a better product in the long run, but, uh, you know, it, it's a growing process at the same time. I, I think where we get in trouble with the podcast, in my opinion, is if we ourselves aren't willing to grow, to learn, to adapt, to uh, really be challenged with some te new technology stuff, uh, new software, new hardware, everything that we can possibly do. If not, we're going to find ourselves in a hole. And we're not going to be able to get out of it because podcast world is changing. And it's like everything else technology wise, it is changing very quickly. Yeah. And, and I'll say back when I started out, uh, it was strictly audio. Uh, I resisted doing video for a long time and, and mostly just because it's a lot of work. I mean, that's just the, the reality of it. Um, audio production uh, can be a black hole in terms of post-production and editing and trying to make everything sound perfect. But uh, I guess to, to answer my, my original question, what is a podcast anyways? Uh, in its purest form, it's, it's just audio, whether it's you speaking solo or uh, if it's some sort of an interview. Uh, as Ryan said, we have morphed into a space where uh, there is kind of an expectation that a podcast will be available in both audio and video format. So regardless of where I want to consume your content, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever I'd like to uh, watch or listen that, you know, is that content available to me wherever, uh, whenever, uh, you know, in terms of what would make sense, and, and we'll get into this in, in a, uh, a little bit more here uh, in a bit, but you do have to think about the time that you have available. Uh, the more formats you add, the more complexity you add to your uh, production time, your planning, your editing, uh, your promotion. Ryan and I can both attest to the more complex you make things, the more time you spend just creating graphics and making promotional uh, items for social media. Uh, if you have the time, I, I do recommend getting into both audio and video, uh, which, uh, you know, it, that might be beyond your comfort level right now. I find like just doing the straight up audio podcast uh, with no video, that's an easy place to start. Uh, there is a comfort level with getting used to being on camera, uh, and that sort of a thing. So, but yes, what is a podcast? It's a lot of things. I bet if we sat down, you know, 10 different people and asked them what a podcast is, we might get 10 different answers. It's, uh, you know, sort of beauty is the eye of the older podcast is whatever somebody, uh, thinks it is. Uh, but in its purest form, it is a straight up audio solo talk or some kind of an interview conversation. Uh, the thing I want to get into next, uh, and I think this will probably take us pretty close into our, first break is finding your why. Uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this lately. Uh, I have a friend who is a very well-known author, mainstream secular space, uh, very famous in his own right. And uh, I was in an airport about three, four weeks ago and he texted me. He's like, Hey, I'm like six, seven episodes into my podcast. And I am just kind of, I'm bored. I'm, I'm really not, you know, I don't, I don't want to keep going. And so it was interesting just to jump on the phone and have a conversation with him and, and just wrestle with, you know, what is your why? Why, why, why are you doing this? And I, I think that looks different uh, for every person. But anytime I talk to somebody about launching a podcast, that's the first thing I ask them is like, well, what is your why? Um, I feel like there, there's a, a number of ways uh, somebody could answer that. And I'll, I guess I'll answer that for myself. And then I'll, I'll have Ryan answer that as well. Uh, but in, ter in terms of a why, my, mine's actually several fold. So on the one hand, I use podcasting as a way to challenge myself uh, and get outside of my comfort zone. I've used it as a way to improve my public speaking skills. I've used it as a way to build my network. Uh, and, th and, you know, that's over the course of eight, nine, 10 years, whatever it's been. Um, but early on, it, it was really just a way for me to meet interesting authors and have great conversations about books, uh, a way to serve the industry that I love being a part of. And so uh, for me, it was it was multifaceted, and so that that's the the question I, I would ask you all to start wrestling right, with right now is what is your why? You know, why do you, why do you want to get into podcasting? You know, there's some easy ones. Well, I want to get my voice out there. I want to build my platform. I want to get the word out about my ministry, my book, my e-course, whatever it might be. And it's certainly a, a marketing vehicle, a promotional vehicle, 
uh, it can sometimes be a way to make money, although I feel like that comes uh, a bit further into the journey. Uh, but I feel like you do kind of need to have that very tangible reason that you're going for it. Uh, the benefits might be less less tangible, graspable, if you will. Uh, but that that is really an important thing to know out of the gate. Uh, I, I, you know, if you're going to create a plan for your podcast, I would clearly define what is your why, what's going to drive you. You know, when you're ten episodes in, why are you going after? Uh, producing this show. Uh, and that could ebb and change over time. I think, uh, you know, like I said earlier, it takes about 10 episodes to kind of find a rhythm and a flow and uh, just, you know, that persona that you're going to develop behind the microphone. Uh, but that that is really critical, I think, for the long haul uh, is finding your why. And, I, you know, and I would just say, and I'll, I'll get into monetization later uh, in the conversation tonight. Uh, but if if your sole goal with the podcast is to make money, I don't know that, that that's a this is the best place for that. Uh, you know, early on, you can certainly get some affiliate opportunities. If you can grow your YouTube following to a decent size of a thousand plus, you can start monetizing there. Um, there there are some uh, basic ways to start monetizing, uh, but monetizing a podcast is is hard work. I mean, you do need to hit. Uh, 10,000 plus 20,000 uh, or more downloads a month to kind of be in that early low level monetization space. So uh, it does take a bit of work to get to a place where advertisers would even want to uh, sow money into your podcast. So, but yeah, you definitely have to have a why. And I'm going to bring Ryan back on. Ryan, any, any further comments you would like to make about your why for your podcast or any thoughts for others who are trying to think through uh, why should they be having their own podcast? Yeah, I think one of the things I would say in discovering the why there, I, I do want to say this as a little bit of a thinking through process that in ministry, there are a lot of opportunities to do things for the sake of building a platform, building a brand, um, creating something that can be marketed and uh, growing that tangibly and putting stuff out there for the sake of knowing that it will sell or it will be a hot product. And, you know, I know a lot of individuals that, that are that way, you know, they, they'll say you need to write a book on this because this will sell, or you need to uh, do this because this will push and this will move. And I understand what they're doing and I'm not criticizing that. I'm just saying, if that's going to be your why it can easily put you into a position where you become systematic and you lose your passion to what you're actually doing in a podcast because your passion becomes about pushing a product and not really why you started to begin with in, in the heart of it. And it's one of those things can be a treacherous road for a lot of ministers, a lot of authors, a lot of podcasters, a lot of ministries, because now it's just about creating content for the sake of creating content that can be pushed, moved, sold, whatever the case may be. I would say to anyone that's going to have a why of the podcast, make sure that it is really connected to your heart. Because anything that's connected to your heart is going to be something that you're not going to lose that passion for. I'm not saying that you ain't going to hit dry spells. I'm not saying that you ain't going to grow tired from time to time. I'm not saying those things. I'm saying when you're just doing something for the sake of, I started a podcast because I wrote a book and I just want to promote the book. As soon as you're done promoting the book, where do you go from there? Uh, if you're trying to create a, a brand and, and, and you change over time, uh, brands come and go, identities come and go. And this is one of the, the traps that I believe a lot of people are making when it comes to ministry. Now, if somebody's launching a podcast, it has nothing to do with ministry. That may be a totally different thing. But I, I really genuinely believe that if your why is not connected to your heart, it's why you fade out in a year. It's why there's no growth in that because there's no actual uh, connection to your heart of the why in podcasting. And some of you who are on the live stream with us tonight, you are already podcasters or you've been creating uh, content in the podcasting and YouTube and live streaming space. So uh, I'd love to see some comments about if, if you've already thought through your why or you, you know kind of where your passion and, and mission align for your podcast. Uh, would love to see some of those comments uh, in the the comment box below, and we'll we'll give you a shout out uh, and mention some of those. 
but again, you know, back back to finding your why. I, I think that is the the core thing that's going to sustain you for the long haul. Um, and also, I, I would say think tr- as much as you can. You know, life changes, things ebb and flow. Um, but but f- finding and understanding your why so it can serve you for the long haul. Uh, you know, think of uh, coming up with a very specific nuance why that will fit with where you're going to be three years from now five years from now uh and we'll even get into that a little bit more in terms of what to name your show you know to make sure the direction you're going is it versatile enough for what you want to do or if you decide that you're going to have a pivot how can you uh have something that's going to meet as many needs as you have uh for the long term and i don't see any comments yet about your why so if you have those please add those uh but i'm gonna have us take a break here for about five minutes uh, so if folks need to get up and grab a drink, head to the restroom, this is the time to do that now. Uh, so I'm going to move us over to the break screen. Ryan and I will be back in five minutes and we will get into uh, the next part of the, our conversation about all the things you need to think through to actually get ready to launch your podcast. So we'll see you in five minutes. Well, I'm still waiting for Ryan to come back here. And so uh, just uh, I thought I'd dro- drop in a comment, something I was thinking of. Uh, you know, one of the things that's fascinated me in the past decade of podcasting is just to see all the places that my my live stream or my my feed podcast feed goes uh, with, with the uh, hosting provider I use. I use Liberated Syndication or Libsyn, as it's called for short. Uh, they've been my podcast host all the way through. That's actually where we host the Destiny Image Podcast Network all the shows that are on there as well. Um, I've loved watching all the places that my podcast goes. Uh, my podcast has been in, I don't know how many countries I've, I've never counted them all up, but it's fun to look at a map and, and just see everywhere that, uh, my conversations with various authors, uh, and leaders touch, uh, each and every month. And so, uh, that's something that, um, uh, I find encouraging, kind of humbling to think that these conversations that I record, uh, that it touches people across the globe. Uh, I'm sure there are some people who listen to my show to learn how to uh, speak better English. Uh, that is one of the things I've, I've, noted, uh, I've noted talking to different people from other countries that they'll, you know, in addition to watching uh, video and TV content uh, to learn English, they'll also listen to podcasts uh, at times as well. Um, and the other thing I think that's been fun, especially in the last three, four years, as uh, technology has just exploded in our ability to easily connect over Skype and Zoom and various other services, is it's easy to talk to people all over the globe. Uh, in the past month, I've interviewed authors in Moscow, Russia, various places in Australia, uh, you know, interviewed a friend recently in Greece and somebody from the UK. And so uh, the ease uh, at which we can connect with authors, leaders, voices uh, all around the globe, you know, not only can our show go so many different places. Uh, the world is open to us in in a, a different way that even three, four, or five years ago, the technology to do it easily just wasn't there. And so uh, we are in such a privileged time in terms of the resources we have uh, to craft messages and share them across the globe. And so uh, it's definitely a great time to take advantage of the podcasting space. I see that Ryan is back with us. I'm going to bring him back into the conversation. Ryan, welcome back from the break, sir. I'm glad to be back. I had to get me a cup of coffee again. <laughs> well, I, I do have that effect on people. I'm drinking coffee throughout the day, uh, mostly to keep myself animated and excited. So uh, I, I feel like we're in sync now that we're both drinking coffee uh, <laughs> as we're on this live stream together. So uh, we've talked about finding your why. If you've got questions about finding your why or comments on that, save that for the Q&A at the end. I'd love to uh, connect with some of that or give you some feedback on what, what you're thinking there. Uh, next, I want to step into how easy it is to get started or what does it take to uh, get started? And uh, I think the first thing I would say is uh, you need to figure out what kind of a show that you're going to have. And so uh, you could have a show that is interview format. Uh, I would say 95% of all the, the podcast content I've done through the years has been interview based. Uh, that can be an easy way to get started in the sense that if you talking solo for 15, 30, 45 minutes just scares the heck out of you, uh, an interview might be an easy place to go. If you have a, a format where you it's more Q&A and you ask a question and you let somebody give a, a sufficient answer to the question, you might talk less than 10 minutes on a 30 or 40 minute podcast. So uh, that can be a pretty easy place to start. Um, 
It doesn't mean you couldn't also uh, mix it up. Some people do both interview and uh, solo shows, you know, maybe half and half or 25%, 75%. It really depends on kind of the, the mission of what you're going after. Um, I've been encouraging people who are starting out right now, if they want to do some interview, maybe you do three teaching episodes and then you do sort of an interview or panel episode where you kind of bookend it and bring in some some experts or, or other folks who can speak to the content you've been teaching about the last few weeks. So uh, there's not a lot of rules uh, as far as that goes, but uh, a big thing is, is what kind of show. Now, I, I, you know, the other other part of that would be format. We've already talked a little bit about audio versus video, or, or do I do both? My recommendation often uh, is to do both. However, I can say on my journey, even though my comfort level has been doing interviews through the years, uh, one of the places God has been pushing me this past year is just to get out front um, and do more solo episodes where I'm. I might be talking or sharing, uh, doing more panel episodes uh, with folks like Ryan and other friends and leaders, uh, or uh, getting out and being interviewed by others. I think I've probably done seven, eight interviews in the past six months, just being on other people's shows, sharing my testimony, my journey, talking about podcasting or marketing or whatever. Um, and so again, I, I'm continuing to you know, mix up the formats and still using podcasting to push myself out of my comfort zones and the boundaries, the boxes that I like to keep myself in if I just want to stay comfortable and stagnant. But I, I break outside and keep moving ahead. Uh, Ryan, I want to see, do you have any additional thoughts on on format or why you went with interview versus solo? You you do a bit of both. I do. I have a combination. And originally, I this is where it kind of shifted for me. I originally wanted to do more um, interviews than I did solo things. But in the beginning, getting interviews was a little challenging, but I wanted to have interviews. I wanted to have a conversation. That's what I was looking for. I really didn't want to set up Q and a time. I wanted to have a genuine conversation and I wanted to pick people's brains. And that's what I set out to do. Um, but what really kind of shifted a little bit of that is occasionally I would run into somebody. I'd be on uh, a ministry trip and somebody would say, I love to listen to your uh, podcast. And I'd say, oh, thanks. I appreciate it. And when I would minister, they would come back to me and go, you preach nothing like your podcast <laughs> or your podcast is nothing like how you speak or teach or preach, whatever. And that kind of caught my attention a little bit. And I realized that, you know, Hey, how I am on my podcast is not necessarily how I am when I minister. And so one of the things I inadvertently started doing was taking some of my live preaching. I preach here a lot in uh, our home at our home church, summit church in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And, you know, we live stream. And so I could take the audio and the video and, and be able to present that on my podcast platform. And so that gave me a little bit of an opportunity to come in and have uh, some live preaching per se. Uh, but occasionally I do do some solo stuff. I shared the word that I had for this year in 2021. I did a solo deal on that. I don't do a whole lot of those. I, my mixture is the interview and the uh, live preaching, just so that people understand who I am as an individual. So that's on that side of it. Uh, what I would say, though, to everybody that when you're you're beginning these these processes, there's there's definitely going to be times that it's going to morph, it's going to transition, it's going to change. You're going to find a rhythm that you like, uh, and it's going to flow better. You're going to get feedback from individuals, but before you do. In the podcast world, I think the most important thing for you to do after you discover your why, know which direction you're going, stay the course in that until you realize that there's something that needs to shift with that. But before you ever record your first one, make the investment into a good podcast mic. Make sure your microphone is good quality. Don't get... Um, don't try to record on your Apple iPods or your plug in, um, head jack, even though this is a head jack, you know, I don't sit here and record off of that. I have my microphone on that. Nobody's going to listen to anything that doesn't have good sound quality. And no matter how good you are editing, some things can't be fixed. So the better the mic, the better the podcast. That is true. So there, there are some sins uh, audio-wise that you just can't recover from in post-production, even if you're an audio ninja. 
<laughs> there, there are limitations to uh, Adobe Audition and Audacity. Um, I want to touch on something Ryan said a moment ago, kind of that there's a difference between uh, preaching versus podcasting. Uh, last year, I had an opportunity to preach on a Sunday, and it was really funny. You know, I'm so comfortable being behind a microphone in my studio here at home and podcasting and talking to lots of folks. Uh, but it, it, it took a little bit of finding a comfort and a rhythm to uh, be, be in front of a microphone uh, with a live audience or, 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 you know, whatnot. And so that it was interesting just to, you know, it's like anything else. You, you kind of, I almost say you sort of step into character. And so when I get behind the microphone, um, I usually will become more animated. My voice will change a little bit. And so um, it was interesting to see that the way I, I, I had to like figure out how to step into preaching because I'm used to being in podcast mode. Uh, when I'm behind a microphone. And so, yeah, they, a little bit different uh, scenarios in terms of how uh, how that works out. Uh, well, next, let's move on and let's talk about coming up with a name for your podcast and picking artwork. Uh, and in terms of names, th this is something to really think through. Um, you know, I've talked to probably 30, 40 podcasters in the last year about what to name their show and, and how to get started with a show. And as, as a guy who's, I think I'm on my fourth, fifth podcast at this point, uh, the names of my shows have changed based on where I worked or what I needed the show to do for me. Um, you know, I kind of wish, I, like, the, I'm currently the Sean Tabbitt show. I wish I'd been that from the beginning, uh, as opposed to I pivoted from um, Author Talks with Sean Tabbitt to the Sean Tabbitt show uh, back in t early 2015. Uh, you know, but the, that other podcast had like 126 episodes that are, you know, they're kind of off in Never Never Land. I've preserved a few of them, but, uh, you know, because I pigeonholed myself into a podcast name where I talked to authors, uh, that did limit me a little bit because, you know, I, I've talked occasionally to somebody who produced a film, uh, somebody who was a musician. And so uh, I, I needed to pivot into a name that just could be more versatile. Um, also, I'm at a place where, you know, I'm, I'm at least known enough in my industry that it makes sense to have a podcast that is branded around my name as as a personality. And so uh, long term, if you want to be known as a, a sort of personality, if you will, or your name uh, will carry more weight, even if it doesn't out of the gate, um, you might really want to consider that. So uh, in, in terms of name, I would say, you know, look at the space of the podcast that you already listen to. Uh, the space that your podcast wants to speak into. Are there certain buzzwords or keywords uh, that might make sense for you to use? Uh, you want to be careful not to choose a name that somebody else might have copyrighted or trademarked. Uh, that's going to be a no, no, no. You'll get some kind of a cease and desist um, at some point. Uh, but you're also going to want to step into something that fits uh, for your personality. And so kind of the, the rhythm, the flow uh, of the show, something you're going to feel good uh, saying, something that's memorable, uh, if it's going to impact your URL on a website, make sure it's something to easy to remember and something that's easy to spell. Uh, so a name is really, really important. I, I would encourage you to uh, spend a lot of time just thinking through, praying about that, being sure, you know, not unlike the why, that it's going to serve you uh, for the long haul. And so, uh, you know, obviously, Author Talks with Sean Tabbitt, all the way on to the Sean Tabbitt Show. Uh, Ryan's got the Blacksmith Chronicles that ties to his personal story, his personal journey. It's very important to him. And so, yeah, you got to figure out what's going to make sense for you there. Uh, any other comments about naming your show, Ryan, before we move on to artwork? Yeah, I think, um, too, you got to know where you're at. You know, um, you know, for example, if you are already established in ministry, it would be wise just to put your name on it because you already have an identity on it. Um, and so, I mean, there's that to be thinking of, uh, for me, uh, it, it has become something that has become an identity in and of itself. So I, I think long-term vision, you got to think of that as well. You may come up with a show that, uh, has a title that in 10 years, you may not like that title or that identity that it does because it has inadvertently created that for me, because now I have people that, Will acknowledge a blacksmith identity. I mean, I have a poster behind me right here, blacksmith knowledge that was given to me as a gift. And that's just one of many things that is coming. So it's something that has attached itself to me. And I love that fact that it has because of the personal story to it. But that's just when we're naming shows, well, we got to think way ahead because uh, times change, you, you know, 
uh, our culture changes, society changes. And, and that's just one of those things, because if you build a following, uh, will that show title carry on with that? Well, let's transition now and talk about artwork. Uh, I, I look back on some of the artwork I have. If you search my name in Google Images, you can find some of my janky artwork from back in the day. But that is, that uh, really was representative of the skill level I had with Photoshop uh, in those days. Now I have access to professional designers to create my artwork, uh, which I certainly like a lot better because, uh, you know, I can while I can make a, a mean meme every now and then, I am not a graphic designer. Uh, you know, in the same way that you should really take a lot of time on your your why and your name, you really do want to think through uh, about your graphics. It, it's it's as important as a book cover. You know, we always say uh, we judge a book by its cover. People also judge a podcast by its cover. You know, think of how much uh, stock you put in that thumbnail as you're searching for interviews or podcast episodes or things that you might want to listen to when you're commuting or on a run or whatever. Uh, you do see that that cover art or that album art, if you will, although it's really not an album. Um, and so you really do want to think through what that looks like. What does it represent? Uh, if it is a, a personality based show, uh, I always recommend having a really clean, nice picture of your professional looking picture of yourself on there uh, with the name of your show uh, as big as it can be. So it can be seen in that small uh, thumbnail. Uh, if it's a themed show of some sort that's not reliant on your your image or your name, uh, I think you could have a lot of fun with that. Uh, if if you are a skilled designer, by all means, create your own artwork. Uh, if you're not, you may want to, you know, you could certainly use Fiverr. I've, I've never used Fiverr. Um, or try, try to figure out a way to, to get some more high-level art. Now, there are amazing tools available out there, you know, whether we're talking stencil or Canva or some of the other graphics tools. So in terms of what's available now compared to years ago, there are great tools for creating artwork. So you could probably get something pretty functional uh, on your own at this point. Or if you want something that really pops or is just exceptional, you may want to see if you can connect with a professional designer. That's going to depend on uh, your network or resources that you have available to you. Uh, now, Ryan, I've got a show that has a personality cover because my show is called The Sean Tabbitt Show. Uh, now, you have a, a graphical uh, piece of artwork for your podcast. Talk to us about why you went that route instead of putting your mug on your podcast cover. <laughs> well, you know, um, first of all, I enjoy being hidden. Um, my, kind of a running joke with me personally is I like living underneath a rock. I'm the, my personality you know, if I show up to a conference that has a lot of speakers that I know, and I was not one of the speakers on there, but I show up just as an attendee, I'm the kind of person that sits in the back. Uh, I don't want a front row seat. I don't need a front row seat. I don't uh, need to go to the green room. So it was a natural choice for me not to put my picture on the podcast uh, artwork, the logo, the energy. It was something that I chose because that's who I am as an individual. I would rather my face not be on things, even though I will sit here. Um, and I, and I would say at times I've questioned it, uh, because you have a lot of people that puts their images on there and I've questioned whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. And, and I really don't have the answer for that. I think it is all determining. It's a determining factor of what kind of podcast format you have. What's the formula of the podcast? Because I have different guests, because there's different messages of my own. I think that's one of those things where we can uh, really use an obscure um, artwork such as mine is. And mine really, in, in five years, it, it allows me to kind of, reshuffle it and, and and maybe freshen up the image but you know whether or not i come on there or not i don't know because again i i like living underneath my rock uh, that sounds strange because i'm a minister i travel i preach i podcast i'm on youtube i do all those things i just don't like advertising uh that's just me personally uh so that's one of those things i think uh, individuals would have to weigh out for themselves. In your case, I think it's wise because if I'm looking at the Sean Tabbitt show, well, who's Sean Tabbitt? 
you know, it just makes sense on that. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. But for me personally, it's just because what you're getting is actually who I am as an individual. I asked myself, who is Sean Tabbit every day? I'll let you know uh, <laughs> when I figured out. Tammy had asked us to talk a little bit about rebranding. Uh, Tammy, not sure if we covered what you want to know, but I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, if you need to rebrand and it makes sense or there's just no going back from it, uh, yeah, you probably should consider rebranding. Uh, I would just say the longer you are into the life of a show, the more complicated it is to rebrand in terms of tagging and descriptions and all the places that all the things exist. Uh, you know, if you want to cleanly cut over to something new, uh, it all depends how in depth you want to be about updating. That's really easy if you've got 10 episodes or 25 episodes. But if I want to go back and make some crazy wholesale change to the Sean Tabbit show, we're approaching 600 episodes. So how do I go back uh, and update that, you know, 600 episodes that not only exists in audio, but also in video in lots of places as well. So just the complexity um, of rebranding uh, could could be a ton of work. Maybe that's a rabbit trail that's not worth going down because, um, you know, an alternative to rebranding. And, and again, you would lose some of your audience would be to put a show to rest and cut over to something else. Or, uh, you know, let's say you have a show that has 250 episodes. You're like, I just I need to pivot to something new. You could cut over rename it keep the same rss feeds um and just have a like a cutoff point where you start you know shifting over into the new show and um just keep moving forward that would be a way to not lose all of your subscribers that's probably the, the only you know that, that would be the big danger if you, if you make a, a change and just end a show uh, everybody would have to resubscribe uh the, the thing to always remember is you know, in terms of content creation right now, it's kind of the wild, wild west. You can do whatever you want. You know, there aren't a lot of rules. Uh, you know, obviously we should have schedules and rhythms just to keep ourselves accountable and to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish in a week. Um, but, you know, I, I hear all the time, well, make sure that you release your show consistently every day on Wednesday at 11 a.m. or this or that or the other thing. And we do need consistency, but, uh, you know, you can release your show twice a month or Maybe you release 40 episodes a month on whatever day you feel like it or whatever day it's available. Uh, and so just give yourself some grace and some flexibility because the reality is you're going to have those people who subscribe to you and listen religiously to every episode. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are just going to discover you as they're going about consuming content on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and wherever. And you'll pique their interest with something, you know, an author that they like or a, a book that, that looks interesting to them, whatever it might be. Uh, so I feel like a lot of your new people that find you, find you on social media. They're not necessarily searching you out on Spotify or, or Apple podcasts. Uh, but in, in terms of rebranding, uh, think it through and try to come up with a way that uh, if you have to do it, uh, maybe just rename it, but keep all those old episodes in the podcast feed. And uh, maybe you do an episode, you know, if you're at 250 episodes, episode 251, you talk through, Hey, I'm, I'm at a, I'm at a, a pivot point, I need to rebrand or I want to rebrand. And so this is what we're going to do. And then you just make that shift and you tell your audience why that is. Um, but, you know, I, as I look back on killing off author talks, I'm kind of sad that all those episodes don't exist anymore. You know, that was a, a, several years of work, uh, 126 episodes. Now the, uh, the content, the quality of the content isn't the quality of what I can do today. So maybe it's not so bad that it's gone. Uh, but, you know, I guess if I could go back and do it over again, I'd try to find a way of rebranding uh, where I didn't throw away, you know, 126 episodes, so to speak. So, uh, Tammy, or if anybody else has more questions about rebranding, uh, be sure to ask that in the Q&A. Um, one last comment I would make in terms of artwork and name and, and various things. Remember that this needs to exist in places besides Apple Podcasts and Spotify and wherever people subscribe to podcasts. This might impact what goes into your YouTube channel, live streams that you do on Facebook, maybe stuff that you're putting on Instagram could impact your website. So uh, you do need to think about how, you know, color schemes, things you know, from a branding perspective being connected is going to make sense from not only how it looks in all the places people subscribe to podcasts, but maybe on your website and other social media channels, you do want consistency. Um, it's always nice to have a kind of single image and all the places people come find you. So it feels connected and not, you know, disconnected. So, uh, you know, something else to think through in terms of branding, name, look, color scheme, icons, logos, uh, all of that sort of thing. 
Uh, next, let's talk about music. Uh, every, a lot of times people uh, want to have intro and outro music. Uh, I, I like uh, I like a good intro because it helps me get into the mode like I'm ready for that podcast to start. You know, you hear that music kick off. And you're like, all right, I'm going to listen to my uh, my favorite podcast. Uh, there are many ways to get music nowadays. Uh, I, would, I would say one of the biggest challenges with music right now, uh, even if you buy music from a premium service, if you're going to include it in YouTube videos, that can become a real pain in the butt. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get off track for a minute, but this is important. So, the, so the the music that I use for the Sean Tabbitt show right now, it's music that we've paid a fee for. It's licensed for me to use for my show. Every time I upload a video with that on its YouTube, it gets flagged for a copyright violation. I have to go and up, upload my license and say no. I bought the license. I can use it. And then you know, 30 minutes later. Uh, it, it gets deflagged and my content can go about its merry way and stay monetized. Uh, so that is something to consider. Uh, the other thing I would say, uh, and, and initially, you know, the easy solution for me is just, I don't, I don't include my introduction on uh, my video content anymore. It just goes right into the conversation. And uh, when you think of how people consume content, does somebody really want to sit through your introduction every single time they watch your show? Or are they going to want to get right into that conversation, that content with the guest? Um, I'm going to guess it's the latter. Uh, but that's just something to think about with music uh, is if it is copyrighted music, uh, that could be problematic. In some of the other channels, I've never gotten a flag or a warning uh, for any of my audio content. It's only uh, for the video content where that's been an issue for me. Uh, but in terms of uh, music, I would I would say think of think of it not unlike uh, artwork, you know, if you go and choose stock art for your podcast cover image that everybody else is using, it's probably going to see, seem kind of common. Same thing. If you, you know, you grab free music out of garage band or other free music services, uh, you know, there might be a hundred other shows that use that same intro outro music. So some of this is going to depend on budget level of sophistication that you want to go after. Uh, honestly, you could do a show and not have any music. I mean, there's, there's nothing saying you, you have to have that. And so that's just something you want to think through. Or if you uh, if you want to have kind of a pre-recorded intro and outro, uh, you know, that can be something that you you have pre-recorded and you just append to the front and back of your show each time that you do an episode. Uh, for me, I actually read my intros and outros when I'm on with my guests. And then when I do my editing, I actually overlay my music over the top and uh, fade it in, fade it out and all of that. But uh you know, I just just be be careful with music. If you if you try to use copyrighted music or uh, music by famous musicians, you probably will get dinged uh, at some point. But there's there's lots of resources out there for royalty free music at this point. Uh, Ryan, I don't know if well, one more comment I would have in terms of music. Make sure it fits like your personality and the tone of your show. Uh, I mean, I, I experimented with a bunch of goofy music through the years and had fun with it. Um, and uh, you know, as I look back on some of that content, I kind of cringe at this point. So in terms of just like you're, tr you're trying to set a tone with your artwork and everything else, uh, the music should make sense for kind of the feeling. You know, if, if, if uh, you have some crazy heavy metal music or I don't know, wh whatever, and it, it makes the person listening to your episode all angsty and just frustrated before they even get into your episode, that probably is a bad thing. You're not setting uh, a good tone. Ryan, any other commentary you would add related to music? Yeah, it, it de definitely YouTube is a massive problem right now uh, as far as music. And thankfully, I've never been flagged for mine. Uh, I do have an intro, outro, uh, bass level music. It's the same going in and out. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, for me, it works because I feel like it goes with the blacksmith theme. But also, I have the voiceover and Sean Tabbitt is my voiceover. I, I use a different voice than my own so that someone hears that introduction and they know it's an introduction. But my introduction is like 30 seconds. So it's a real quick and it's a, it's a real quick in and out. But we do have that music. I think that's wise for people to have. Honestly, that's my opinion. Uh, I just automatically think of one of my favorite uh, intro is Magnum P.I., I love the intro to Magnum PI. And when I hear that, I know Magnum PI is on, you know, I just even going back to the old Magnum PI, I'm an old soul people. Uh, so it's one of those things. I think if you can 
find the right sound for your podcast, it will actually help you go further. Yeah, it is kind of trippy for me when I listen to Ryan's show because I get to hear myself read his intro and outro. It even gets weirder because I, I occasionally do ad reads for our podcast network. So uh, when I start Ryan's show, not only do I get to hear myself read an ad for a new Dusty Imager Harrison House book, then I also get to hear myself introduce his show. So that is uh, pretty funny. Um, <laughs> if you not, not that I want to offer this to everybody in the world, but if, if you would like somebody to do a voiceover for you, um, reach out to me. I, I do those occasionally for people uh, just, just to be kind and help out. And I have fun with that. So uh, since you're all part of our first masterclass, if you would like my voice reading your intro and outro, uh, reach out show at seantabbitt.com is an easy way uh, to get in touch with me and would love to help you get that sorted out. Uh, all right. So we've talked about music. Let's continue moving forward. This is uh, this next area is probably the one that I think uh, I get the most questions about. I feel like it's one of the biggest ditches to fall into, uh, and that is equipment. <laughs> and uh, Ryan and I, I think, have, will have some different opinions on this. Uh, but you know, my, my initial feeling about equipment is always look at what you have uh, in front, of, you know, in in your house, you know, either stuff that's in your home office or uh, if you're still going into an office these days, what do you have? Do you have a desktop or a laptop? Do you have headphones? Do you have some kind of a microphone? Uh, you know, a lot of us have headphones with microphones included. So uh, I would say just really take inventory and evaluate what you have uh, before you uh, start dropping fat wads of cash on stuff that you don't even know how to use. So uh, that, that, that's one thing where I find a lot of times people have most of the equipment they need to start a podcast. Uh, they just don't realize it. Uh, pro probably the, the saddest thing for me is when somebody goes out and spends like a grand or more on a mixer board and a microphone and the podcast sounds awful because they have no idea how to use all this equipment they just bought. Uh, my, my thing is always start simple and then build the complexity out from there. Uh, for me, I started out using USB microphones for many years uh, initially. And as, as, as I've been podcasting longer, I've invested more in equipment and gone through various different XLR to USB interfaces and mixer boards. And so, uh, you know, you can spend very little, uh, you can spend a lot. So uh, I would say at a basic level, uh, you if, if you wanted to be super not fancy and your quality probably would suffer a little bit, although I would say with some of the headphones that people have available today, uh, it might not be too bad. And at a very basic level, if this was just you doing a solo show, you could record something with your iPhone and some earbuds or AirPods, and it might not be the best in the world, uh, but it could be a place to start. So in terms of like, barrier to entry that's kind of the lowest place <laughs> started starting out like that um going past that uh some kind of a usb microphone uh, i saw there was some comments about that i'll actually uh, put out a link to uh, a little podcasting resource guide i share when i do talks like this that lists a couple of uh the microphones that i've appreciated through the years uh but in terms of a, a decent usb microphone you're probably looking at uh, 40 to $80 is a really typical price range for somebody that's something that's going to be uh, decent quality. Uh, in terms of uh, headphones, earbuds, uh, kind of all over the place, uh, Bluetooth can be a little tricky uh, because there can be delay with Bluetooth a little bit, uh, especially if you're doing a lot of video and live streams. And so that can be kind of trippy when you're editing. Uh, like, like these headphones that I have on right now, these actually connect to a 2.4 gigahertz USB dongle, which doesn't have the delay uh, that Bluetooth has. So I love these because they're wireless, but it doesn't have that delay factor uh, that you generally have on Bluetooth. Headphones are kind of easy. Earbuds, studio headphones, kind of whatever whatever you're most co more comfortable with. I like these big headphones just because I have 10 kids and my house gets loud. So this helps block out uh, a lot of the background noise. Uh, Ryan, any comments about microphones? Yeah, I mean, I'm just now myself making some more modifications. I started out very simple. I started out with a pseudo tack, um, less than 50 bucks. It's a USB mic, and I'm just now transitioning over into XLR mics and a board and everything. So, I, you know, I've done a lot of mine simply from my uh, laptop, and I think that is very sufficient for a lot of people. Uh, to really do that because you can do it and do it well and make it work. 
you might have to do a little bit of work on the, you know, back end of it, but it's okay. And you just got to figure out what works best for you and what your, your level of comfort zone is there. I agree with Sean wholeheartedly. I don't think it's, it's wise to go spend a lot of money unless you have somebody that's going to be doing the stuff for you. You know, I don't have that luxury. I don't have a personal assistant or a media guy that is doing everything now. You know, hopefully I'll get as famous as the Sean Tabbit show and I can afford that and uh, have that in my back pocket. But because uh, I'm not going to have as many as kids that he's doing, he's de- he's growing up uh, his personal assistance. But nevertheless, but I I would say that wholeheartedly to people that you know, don't don't try to go so big and, and, and broad, just figure out what works the best. But. You can, like I said, less than a hundred bucks, you can find a good mic. And that's going to be the most important thing on that. And you're going to figure out as far as your head, I can't use both of my, uh, I can't use the headset like Sean is, or if I have both in my ear, because I feel like I'm talking in a drum and I, I can't hear very well in that. And it throws me off. So you'll see me a lot of times. So you're just going to find a rhythm that works with whatever headgear you're going to use. I would not recommend uh, me personally. I wouldn't recommend Bluetooth things just because uh, you think you got it charged and it dies on you mid podcast or whatever. It's just easier to have things plugged up and know that it's plugged up and it's working at full capacity. Yeah. And uh, a couple more comments on microphones. Uh, Dynamic microphones are generally going to be better than uh, a lot of the other options. Uh, a lot of us are recording in various uh, spaces in our house or our office. So uh, a dynamic microphone is typically the way to go. Uh, you know, if you do a little bit of research, uh, you could have a reasonably priced dynamic microphone. If you can do some sound treatment uh, in your room, that could make a big difference. Uh, you can't see it in this corner of my office, but uh, I've got sound absorbing foam up on the walls in the other corner of my office slash studio space. So uh, there, there are some different ways you can set up some sound absorbers to improve the sound quality of your room. Uh, but generally, uh, a dynamic microphone would be the way to go, uh, especially when you're starting out. So uh, again, kind of just from a budgetary perspective, you know, I'd say expect to spend anywhere from 40 to $80, uh, for a decent USB microphone. Uh, and that would be a good place to start. Uh, I, uh, when I've given this talk, I haven't normally talked about webcams, but, uh, this seems like a logical place to get into webcam since we're doing uh, a live stream. Uh, we're at an interesting time with webcams because most of the webcams that come on our laptops or on our phones are kind of inferior quality wise. They tend to often be 720p. Uh, you're getting uh, some of the newer uh, phones, cameras, computers, you know, you are starting to get uh, more 1080p, even some 4K uh on average, you know, for just a decent stream, something that's 720p or 1080p should be uh, more than sufficient. Uh, I would, you know, as long as your your webcam is decent, I don't know that I'd buy an external webcam. I'm using a Logitech C920 for this broadcast, which is a webcam that I got five years ago, six years ago. I've used this one for a long time. Uh, max resolution is 1080p, and I've been real happy with that. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, sometimes having an external webcam that you can move and put on a tripod is a little bit more convenient, depending on whether you're using a laptop or a desktop, uh, that sort of a thing. But webcams are pretty pretty cheap these days. Uh, you know, anywhere from on the low end, uh, twenty bucks, uh, up to you know, if you're looking to go something 4K, uh, 200, 250 bucks. If you want to go wild and crazy and, you know, do DSLR with an Elgato interface, you know, then you're talking, I don't know, 600,000 bucks in equipment, depending on the body of the camera and the lens. I've not gone fancy enough to go DSLR yet. That has its own complexity, complexities and challenges. So if you already have a DSLR camera and you, you just want to have that quality of the video for your stream uh, by all means, uh, but that, that is a whole nother rabbit hole that adds a lot of complexity um, I just I like to stick with just the standard USB webcam for me or something built into uh, a laptop just because it's it's easy. Uh, it works. You know, there's it's just a single interface versus if you have a camera plus another device and just, you're, you're lining up the number of things that can go wrong. So we talked about uh, microphones. We've talked about cameras. Let's talk about mixer boards and interfaces. So if you want to go 
uh, XLR. Uh, there's a, there's, you can actually get microphones that are both USB and XLR, which can be kind of fun. Uh, then you have a little more versatility uh, with how they're used. Uh, if you're going with a USB microphone, you will typically have some level of gain control on the microphone. Uh, but other than that, you're pretty much stuck with the sound control that you have in the control panel, uh, whether you're on a Windows machine or on a Mac. And then whatever sound uh, controlling elements are available in your recording software or your streaming software. Um, so in that kind of a scenario, you do have, you know, what's set on the microphone, potentially what is set in the control panel for your computer, and also what is set in your, your recording software or uh, your streaming software. So there, you know, there can be three different settings to consider uh, for the sound quality in the USB scenario. If you get some kind of an XLR interface, uh, rather than the control being on the microphone itself, it's going to be on the board that you have. Uh, XLR interfaces can be as simple as you plug a microphone into it. It's got a USB out that plugs into your computer, and typically it'll have some kind of a gain setting on it. Uh, that's a pretty straightforward, simple interface. You can get something like that for anywhere from 25 bucks on up to as much as you want to spend. Uh, when you're getting to the place that Ryan and, our, Ryan and I are, we both have uh, fan, I know Ryan's getting a new mixer. I just got a uh, Zoom PodTrack P8, which I love. Uh, it's got good noise canceling features and a bunch of other fancy stuff. Uh, that goes for like five, I think it was $500. So uh, it's quite an investment to uh, replace an interface that I already had that simply allows me to connect uh, my, my, my XLR microphone to uh, my computer. Now it has a bunch of other enhanced features that are really amazing. So uh, that's a board that will grow with me for, for many years in terms of what it has available. Um, I guess one last comment I'd make on microphones. You'll see mo many of our podcasting friends, and I, I think some of us even uh, on this broadcast, we already have a show. Um, you're using the Shure SM7B, which is a fantastic microphone. They go for about $400. Uh, you see one of those, you're like, man, I really want to get one of those. Uh, that's an XLR microphone, so it's going to need an interface. Uh, just one comment I would make on those is a lot of times if people have that Shure SM7B, and that, that's actually the next microphone I want, um, you will probably want to consider getting a cloud lifter. Uh, that goes for about $200. So to, to get that microphone, uh, to get enough gain on it, you typically do need a cloud lifter. Uh, so you don't have to amp up uh, the level on your board too high. So uh, there's, there's just some things to consider. Uh, I would say in terms of uh, some of the more basic, like USB microphones, sub $100, pretty low risk investment. When you're getting into equipment where you're talking about, about spending $400, $600, or what have you, uh, find some other creators that use that equipment and just get their feedback about how easy it is to set up and to maintain. Uh, do they have any issues? Just get feedback because for all of us who are um, creating content, we use this equipment almost on a daily basis and we've had to figure out how to set it up. So uh, before you uh, make a big purchase, I would just get input from other people in this space and just let them give you a little insight uh, and feedback. So I'm pretty jury out between XLR versus USB. USB is easiest. Uh, it's pretty versatile. You can fold it up, put it in the case and travel with it and podcast on the road. So, uh, you know, it, it does simplify stuff. So that can be a nice place to start out. Uh, but you'll quickly want to get to a place where you're having better quality. And uh, like anything else, you sort of get what you pay for. So uh, we've talked about microphones, webcams, uh, audio interfaces. Uh, I guess the other thing I would say um, is computers. We, we haven't talked about that. Uh, I, I'm live streaming tonight using a Windows machine. I've got both a Windows machine and a Mac uh, kind of jury out. I was like a solo Mac guy for about a decade. And then I got into more video editing and complex stuff. And it costs a small fortune to, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, costs a small fortune to pimp out a MacBook or a Mac Pro. Uh, I can, you know, drop $500 into a mid-range window machine and have a screaming editing box. And so that's that's what I've done. I'm, I'm doing a lot of my uh, work uh, on Windows machines these days. Uh, I still use my, my Mac for very specific things, but uh, your workstation doesn't have to be a barrier to entry, whether you have a Mac or a PC, they'll both run Audible or uh, Adobe Audition and can generally handle Skype, Zoom, all the normal ways that you would tend to connect with guests. So um, years, you know, Three years ago, I would have said I would recommend having a Mac uh, just with how 
easy it is to use more of the web-based tools that we're using for podcasting these days. As, as long as your machine has sufficient RAM and a good network connection, uh, either, either one would probably be a good choice. Uh, Ryan, any other thoughts on equipment? Something that is a must-have tool that I've somehow missed so far in the conversation? <laughs> well, I am a Mac guy. I, I don't, I've not used a petrified computer in many years, so um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm the Mac guy, so I'm gonna, I'm, you know, I'm gonna say naturally the Mac, just because um, media-wise, Mac is just built a little bit. So that's just my personal opinion. Doesn't mean I'm right on that, but a couple of things is I wouldn't personally tell anybody to buy a webcam right now. Now, if you have a studio, yeah, you want to invest in a 4K camera or something like that. And my goal one day is to have a podcast studio and actually have different angles and shots and all that and everything. But, you know, I'm not there yet. So why invest in a webcam? I would take that money and invest in a microphone or maybe software or maybe you want to do a board. You don't have to have a board. I'm just now upgrading to a Behringer eight channel board. And it's about half of the cost of what uh, Sean has with the Zoom board. He said it was 500. The Behringer board is 250. So it's half of that. Um, you know, you do have some free things. I'm sure PCs have it. I'm not 100% sure because I'm not uh, used genuinely. I've not used the PC in many years. But as far as the Mac uh, laptops and computers go, GarageBand, uh, you can do all your editing in that. You don't have to use Audacity. You can use GarageBand in that. You just have to get you know comfortable used to it. It comes with the Mac notebooks or computers. The iMovie uh, is also something you can do for the video side of it. Now, there's different options that you can buy editing software, Adobe, a course, and you can get that and get a little bit more fancy. But you, you don't have to start out fancy is what I'm getting at. And you can you can use the basic fundamental tools that are there in the beginning and make that work for you in that moment. As you grow and as you advance, you do that. But one, one item that we've not mentioned that I, I would like to mention is lighting. Uh, it is very, very important that you invest in some form of lighting uh, to be able to have uh, a good, I mean, whatever your backdrop is, it doesn't matter if you're using a green screen or this is actually my office here. Um, and no, I have not read every single book, but I've read a large majority of those books, uh, contrary to what my high school uh, counselor would probably believe or my English teacher would. But <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, you still want lighting on you. It's one of the worst things that we can do when we're doing video is not see the individual that we're talking to or the guest or whatever the case may be. So even if you don't buy the webcam, buy, buy the light. You know, um, you can get a good light off of Amazon for about 150 bucks or less. Uh, and it's, you know, you can do USB, you can do direct plug-in. Whatever the case may be, invest in the lighting and make sure you get something that you do show up. If you're going to do video, if you're not going to do video, you're strictly going to do audio. There's no point in that. And webcams and, you know, external cameras and all that, all that talk is irrelevant. But there's a lot of things that can be easily done and taken advantage of. Audacity is a free program. You just got to get used to training and using that as well. Like I said, GarageBand is free. Um, iMovie's free. I know PC has some things out there. Uh, Sony has a really good editing. If you don't want to pay the price of Adobe, uh, Sony has a good video editing software out there as well. There's multiple things to do, but again, this is economically something that you really got to sit down. You got to hash out. What do I want to invest right now versus what am I, what am I trying? What's my goal? Am I, you, you know, am I trying to look good, but not have good content? I would rather you have good content than trying to look good on camera or in audio and you spend a thousand dollars, but your content's bad. The, the content is, has got to have more value and worth than naturally your, your, your uh, software or your hardware, even though those things are important. I'm not discrediting none of that. Just man, because some of the best shows in the world can look great, but put you to sleep. <laughs> well, hopefully you're not talking about my show, Ryan. Uh, Absolutely not. 
Yeah, I mean, that, it's funny to think about lighting and green screens. You know, when I've given podcasting talks even a year and a half ago, we didn't talk as much about live streaming or some of those additional tools because it wasn't as standard uh, as it is today. Um, this is actually a green screen behind me. I've got a retractable green screen. It's like a four by eight or four by seven. I don't know what the full size of it is when it's fully uh, expanded. But uh, the, the thing with green screens is uh, not every software tool can handle them well. Like uh, right now we are producing this over StreamYard. And I mean, you can see the the software is able to handle that gap between the, the top of my headphone band and my head. Uh, uh, also, uh, Zoom does really well with that. However, um, like some of the Google Meeting, Google Video and Skype and some of the others don't do nearly as good of a job of handling small spaces in the green screen. So I've been very impressed with what StreamYard can do and with what Zoom can do. Um, and in, in terms of lighting, you know, it's... Uh, it's it, it's a uh, it's a balance trying to figure out what what works um, what isn't going to glare so much in your glasses like right now the glare that's in my glasses actually comes from my monitor that's in front of me here um, I'm using uh, some photography uh, box lighting uh, I got a set two lights I think they run about seventy dollars they're kind of bulky for my office space uh, but they work well I've also got some LED lights that I've been playing with that actually mount to my desk I like those. Um, although I feel like the LED light is a bit much sometimes. So, um, you know, uh, like anything else, it's going to vary by the space that you're in. So you got to figure out something that's going to work. Uh, but at a minimum, uh, you know, it's great if you can have at least three lights uh, positioned properly. Uh, but at a minimum, if you can get one quality light that has some sort of a diffusion or if you can control how bright it is, uh, it can really improve the quality of your video. And so uh, your video, it's a combination of uh, the quality of your camera, the lighting you have, uh, is, is your camera like one that's just foc standard focused all the time? Is it, does it adjust itself? I mean, it, uh, it can drive you kind of crazy. So you'll, you'll just have to figure out what works best with your equipment. Um, one thing I always like to say is, can you set things up and leave it set up? So it's just ready to go. Uh, regardless, uh, I actually have two workspaces in my office, one that's for live streaming and podcasting another that's just more of a desk space. So if you can leave it set up all the time, uh, you're less likely to unplug something or forget something or, or change a setting. So uh, not everybody has the luxury of a big enough space to do that. But if you can, uh, it is always nice to do that. Uh, Ryan talked about software. I want to touch on software in a little bit when we get to the part of our conversation about editing. Uh, let's pivot now and talk about planning. Um, you know, I've been podcasting for, as I said, eight, nine years, 10 years, whatever it's been. Um, and I've, I've, in terms of doing interviews, I've got a plan. I've got a rhythm, uh, that I step into when I get ready for an episode. So, uh, you know, in, in the case of Ryan's podcast, his intro, his outro, it's already pre-recorded. So other than, you know, him introducing his guests, he doesn't have to worry about that versus I actually record my intro and outro every single time that I do an episode, uh, mostly because I like to make sure that my sound and audio level is consistent throughout the interview. Sometimes you can get into a weird place where uh, your intro and outro sounds one way, and then you record an episode and you have a cold so or whatever when you're in the interview, it just sounds different. That's just me being neurotic and super uh, perfectionistic. So uh, Ryan's probably smarter with the way that he does it. Um, but in, in terms of, of making a plan, at, at a basic level, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll just run down how I do it, and then I'll have Ryan share how he does it. Um, so if, if I'm interviewing an author, you know, if I can, I'll read through the whole book or skim it, listen to the audiobook. It really depends how much time I have. Uh, but, I, but I'm looking to do three, four things in every episode. I want you to get to know that, uh, that guest backstory, who they are, what, you know, wh where they came up, why were they the person to write this book? And that's usually two or three questions. Uh, I'll typically get into like a story behind the book. What, were they responding to something they saw in their own life, a need in culture, a need in the church, and what have you? Uh, usually three, four questions about specific content from the book, um, looking for opportunities to draw out specific stories or testimonies. Uh, I can't emphasize that enough in terms of people really connecting with your podcast episode or connecting with a book and wanting to go and either buy that book or tell their friends about it. It is the story they will remember. You can teach from your book all day long and, and maybe one in 10 people are going to remember you know, the, the three points that you gave from your book. Uh, I would I would venture to say six, seven of those 10 people will remember a story that touched their heart or just 
was out of the box or illustrated some key point to the book. So, um, you know, if you've read, read and consumed the content of a book enough that you can actually know what stories or even before you get into the interview, tell the guest, hey, you know, I really loved this that you shared in the book, this testimony. I, I'd love for you to find a way to work that into the interview. Just kind of set that up ahead of time. And that will make people tell more people about the episode. It will make people go out and buy the book and tell their friends about the book. So stories uh, are critically important. Um, and then towards, you know, wrapping up, I'm always looking for like, what's that takeaway? How did you hope that you, the book impacts the reader? Um, I'll often ask guests to pray uh, for the listeners and the viewers. Uh, and then where can they go to connect with you on the web, find out more, buy the book, that sort of a thing. Um, for 90% of all of my episodes and nine years, whatever it's been, I'm going for that every single time. That's the format I've created for my podcast. So if I'm doing a, a discussion or a panel or something else, by all means, it's different and there's a whole lot less planning. Uh, but when I go into an interview, I've typically spent at least at a minimum one and a half to two hours planning and prepping. Sometimes it's a whole lot more if I you know, spend a lot of time reading an entire book. So uh, there's a lot that goes into just even getting ready to do uh, any single episode. So Ryan, let's hear about your process, man. How do you make the sausage? Well, this is where we would say Ryan does podcast, not the correct way. <laughs> I, I do prepare. Uh, I never want anyone to feel like I've not prepared or a guest doesn't feel that way or a listener doesn't feel that way. Um, my preparation looks definitely different. If I get an author of a book that I'm not familiar with, I will um, get either the content of the book. I'll get the book itself. I'll dive in and, and understand what they were saying and what they were doing. I'll research the individual. I'll go to their website. I'll read their bio, read, you know, what they're doing. I'll go to their social media page, YouTube, and I'll do my research in that. However, I don't go through and have a uh, set list of questions based off of a book or a sermon or whatever the case may be. Uh, if they're having a book that they're just now released, I will be sure to make sure that we acknowledge the book, that we talk about the book some, we promote the book, tell people where to find the book, all that type of stuff. I'll do all that. But mine is very off the cuff. My, my podcast is um, unique in the sense that I do not send out questions. And that makes guests nervous at times. Uh, it complicates things at times. It 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 does get a little bit uh, frustrated and at times here and there. But let me say this, just because this is one of the things that I do, I don't recommend everyone else to do that. It, this is a form of improv in a way, and not everybody can be um, can do improv. They can't think off the cuff. So it's one of those things that you don't ever want to be sitting there blanking out trying to come up with a question. For me, the reason I am the way that I am and I don't have this list of questions and, and have everything laid out is because it is my goal to have a real time conversation. So that means I have to take out every distraction because I can be easily distracted. I like my office door. I put a sign up that we're recording. People know not to bother me, not knock on the door, not to distract me. And what I do with each guest, even though I have I've prepared and I know that there's some things I want to bring up, such as their book, how to find that, everything. I start out asking them a question and then I intently listen to their answers and it automatically starts feeding another round of questions. And the questions start coming from me is because I want to know the answer to those questions. I'm not asking something to fill up a, a slot or a time on my podcast. I'm asking stuff because I want to know. Now, again, I tell people what we're doing up in advance, but, you know, in podcasting world, that makes people a little nervous because they're accustomed to having a set list of questions to be able to be prepared and have that in front of them. And I've made some guests very nervous before, you know, I, one particular guest, I, I remember when I was done, she, she just let out like a sigh of relief. And she's like, in the beginning of this thing, I didn't know where you were going with this, but I love the journey that you took us on. And, you know, at, for me, that's the highlight. 
that's the point where I'm going, I want to take people down a road that they themselves didn't think about going down. And they were able to talk about stuff because one of the things, and I want to say this to everybody, because uh, with Sean and myself, a lot of times we have the same guests, you know, we're de- we're part of destiny. We have destiny authors, we have destiny ministers and stuff from time to time. So I don't want anybody to listen to the Sean Tabbitt show and feel like they just got the same thing on the blacksmith Chronicles. Or if I listen to the blacksmith Chronicles, they get the same thing on the Sean Tabbitt show. I, that's not what I'm going after. And I think of that too, because of all these people, you know, I've had the opportunity to interview uh, some very well-known guests. And I think, okay, they have a new book out. We're going to discuss that book. Well, how many other podcasts are they going to be doing concerning that book? I don't want somebody to listen to the same thing over and over and over again. I want them to experience something that is brand new. But I, I, I say this and I say it with caution. If you can't think off the cuff, don't take that route. Do like Sean does and, and have all those questions lay out. But I, I, at the same time, I want to say, if there's something that's stirring in you, don't let your format automatically keep you from asking something because you don't want to lose who you are as an individual. I think it's important to be you. When, when I'm asking these questions, again, it's because I want to know the answer to them. I'm growing in these podcasts. I'm being challenged in this podcast, which we would have to go back all the way to the beginning to understand, but that's the goal, and that's the way I do it. Uh, Anna asked a question, how do we prepare? How do you prepare when you're not doing an interview? Uh, I, w- I would say for me, that's something I grew into. My comfort level was doing interviews. It's how I started out. I've done hundreds and hundreds of those. Uh, I would say where where it differentiates is I will typically have some kind of a, a topic or a theme that I want to talk about, you know, whether that's a panel or with, you know, like another person like Ryan, where we're going to go down a road together. Um, you know, we'll usually have some kind of a title for the episode just to know uh, where we're going to go. And, you know, for me, I usually will make some kind of an outline and just try to have a range of things I could talk about. And then I'll just kind of flow with where the Holy Spirit leads or if it's with uh, uh, several other people where the conversation leads. Um, I would say early out, I overplanned just to give myself um, kind of a, a comfort zone of saying I have a fully planned out interview that I can do and step into um, versus, you know, now uh, I still do a lot of planning, but sometimes I don't even get to half of what I had planned because I you know start going off on rabbit trails and just have more of a conversation. And, you know, we, we've entered into a space with uh, podcasting and streaming media where people like conversations. They like feeling like they are a part of a real uh, interaction versus not that there's anything wrong with just more wooden interviews from time to time, but things that are more conversational just feel warmer and brighter. And uh, I feel like they're a little bit easier to connect with. Um, so, you know, everybody has a comfort level. I think, you know, depending on your experience, if you preach or speak or teach regularly, uh, you know, you're probably a little bit more used to being off the cuff or just speaking from uh, a handful of notes. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like the answer to that question is going to vary by kind of your background and experience. But I can say for me, I, I always have at least some kind of a theme uh, and a loose plan, maybe a list of topics or, or like high, you know, key high level points I want to hit in the conversation. Um, but as I've gotten more comfortable and confident and competent in podcasting, um, I deviate from my plan more and more and more. Um, and I find when I deviate from my plan, that's where the gold really comes out. That's where very unexpected things come up in the conversation that they've never shared in an interview before. And that, and, and I'm like, wow, the Holy spirit led us down a path. And that was the most fantastic part of the interview. I find it's those like weird rabbit trails that you didn't plan those are the things that everybody comments on because they've never heard that guest share or talk about that before, or it somehow brings some magical aspect of the book out that if you'd stuck to the plan or stuck to the questions in the press kit, you never would have gotten there. So um, maybe I'm trying to become more like Ryan at this stage of my podcasting journey. <laughs> well, one thing I would say, because I have done a few, but it's just been me and it's not been a sermon. It's not been preaching. I've been sharing out of myself. The, I would say podcasting is a lot like writing. You got to be creative and expressing your story, your detail, your topic, you know, uh, but at the same time, 
don't try to imitate, don't try to copy. So in my preparation, I'm going through and I'm going, okay, I want to make sure that I talk about this, but is, is this what everybody else is talking about? Cause I don't, I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to be down that because if this is what everybody else is talking about, count me out. I want to know that, you know, I'm staying true to myself in this, but also in, in, in checking, if you're going to quote anybody, this is just my opinion. I think it's wise in your preparation to make sure you say the quote right and you give credit to the one who said the quote. I'm a big believer in making sure that we give honor where honor is due and we don't try to hijack something. I know we're podcasting, but, it, you know, an author can get in serious trouble for plagiarism. And I think we ought to honor that same thing when we're podcasting. We, we shouldn't try to take, and I'm a huge Ravenhill fan, I shouldn't try to take a Ravenhill quote and try to make it my own and try to sound deep and you know, all awesome and, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the things in a personal, if I'm not interviewing anybody, if I'm going to quote anything, I make sure that I got the quote right and I'm giving credit to who it, who it actually belongs to. Uh, Cara asked a question about length of a podcast. Uh, this is a fun thing to explore in this day and age. So uh, length of podcast is all over the place in the sense that um, you've got kind of those sub 10 minute, five minute sort of daily devotional podcast. I could list four or five of them that friends of mine do all the way to, you know, Joe Rogan, where he's doing two or three hours sometimes uh, in an interview and people will actually listen to it and watch it, which is, is fascinating. And it makes me wonder how we have that much free time on our hands if we can listen to or watch a three hour podcast, but maybe, maybe we all watch those in multiple sittings. I, I don't know. Um, there, there aren't a lot of hard and fast rules for length of podcasts. Um, I, I would probably answer that question a number of ways. Um, one is always, what's realistic? How much time do you have? If you've got time to put together a five or 10 minute or 15 minute podcast, great, then then do that. I mean, if that's what you have time for, uh, then fantastic. Um, if you have time to do a half hour or 45 minutes, that's great too. Uh, if you want to do an interview and break it up into two parts. You know, you do a half hour interview, you do part one, part two. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's necessarily any hard and fast rule. So some of it is going to depend on, you know, the time and availability you have. Um, but like anything else, it's just uh, creating a message, a communication that's going to go to an audience. So, uh, you know, as long as you promote it and build that audience, you know, regardless of the length, I think you could find people who would be happy to listen to a five to 15 minute podcast or a, 30 minute interview podcast that's, you know, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, you get Tuesday, part one, Thursday, part two. Uh, you know, it's, it's the wild west. You can kind of do uh, whatever works for you. My thing is like, I'd rather see people, see people get out there and create and, and, and make content and connect with an audience and start kind of building a brand and a platform. And um, if you can only do that for 15 minutes a week or 30 minutes a week or whatever it looks like, uh, then maximize the time that you have. You know, I, I, I can say that, uh, the ability to connect with an interesting audience via podcasting and video uh, is wonderful and you'll meet people and make friends and your, your uh, network will grow like crazy uh, over time. So uh, for me, 30 minutes is kind of what I'm looking for for most of my episodes. Um, I think when a podcast gets edited down, uh, my average show is about 25 minutes. Um, uh, in terms of scheduling, I, I schedule in 30 minute blocks uh, if you're really looking for high profile authors, you're blessed to get 30 minutes. Some will only give you 15, 20 minutes. It's the rare guest that wants to give you an hour of their time. Their folks are <laughs> tend to be pretty busy, uh, just like we're all busy. Um, but that's not to say if, if people will go 35, 40, 50 minutes, sometimes it gets to be a really long episode and I love that and it's great. Uh, but you know, it's if you're doing interviews, that's the balance too, is how much time is somebody really gonna give to you? We wanna be respectful. Uh, because if they're promoting a new book, you know, they're trying to do lots of interviews, uh, not just their, not just your show. So, uh, Ryan, any additional thoughts on length of show? I think your why determines your length. I think w what kind of podcast you're doing will really be that deciding factor. If you're doing a devotional, you don't need to have an hour long um, devotional podcast. If you're doing an interview, I, you know, it's going to be 30 minutes to 45 minutes. For me, my goal is 45 minutes. Now, I will say this, I rarely ever hit it. Uh, usually we go over a little bit. Uh, and I tell my guests up front, that's, that's what my goal is for 45 minutes. But 
when you get into good conversation, time becomes irrelevant. And I've looked at the statistics and I've tried to figure out whether or not I'm wrong or right on that. And the time length as far as podcast statistics are all over the board. Uh, you'll have people say that this generation can only attain anything less than 20 minutes. This generation won't listen to anything less that's no more than 12 minutes. Uh, and, and you'll see stuff like that. But then you, you got the Joe Rogans that is the number one constantly. Now he might get knocked off occasionally, but he comes back the number one podcast program and it's well over three hours at times. So I think, you know, you can present if you want to go of 30 minutes and it goes an hour, you can do a part one and a part two. But one thing that I feel like you can test in this is people are, can pause. They can stop their podcast at any time and come back to where they were at. And for me, I've learned that's what works. If I have an episode that is an hour long, people just pause it and come back to when they, they want to have it. I don't have a million um, following, but I've never had anyone yet to uh, email me, call me, message me or anything and say, you know, it's just too long and it's too much. I actually have more feedback of people saying it wasn't enough. When the, con the, when the content is good, time becomes irrelevant. Uh, and one last thing I would say in regards to planning uh, is scheduling and scheduling can be a huge time suck and a big disaster. <laughs> uh, as, as somebody who has served as a publicist for a few years and uh, marketing manager and all sorts of different things in the, the PR space, um, scheduling uh, is the lifeblood <laughs> of uh, interviews, uh, but it can be a, a huge problem. And so uh, Ryan and I both use uh, a tool called Calendly. Calendly.com is where you can find that. Um, I just use a free account. Uh, you can get a paid account with additional features as well. Uh, but you can tie that to an Outlook calendar or a Google calendar and set parameters in terms of, you know, what, when people can schedule and, uh, you know, time of day and how many events can be scheduled in a given day. And so uh, for me, that is a lifesaver. Uh, and, and especially with working with other um, podcasts like Ryan's, when I have somebody who I want to have be a guest on a show, it's great that I can just send them his Calendly link and their assistant, or they can directly just book the time for his show, goes on Ryan's calendar, goes on their calendar. And so that that is probably one of the biggest uh, time-saving tools that has nothing to do with podcasting directly, but uh, it has to do with the scheduling of the podcast. Also, for working with guests who are overseas, um, if you have a guest in the UK, Australia, wherever, uh, when they bring it up, Calendly is location-aware, and so it will show them what's available in their time zone. And so it's just less confusing than trying to email five, 10 times, trying to figure out the difference in the time zone. So um, Calendly is a lifesaver. I can't recommend it enough. It's one of my favorite tools. If I could have every podcaster, radio show or TV show I work with use that for scheduling, uh, it would my make my life a lot easier. It certainly saves me a lot of emails. Uh, I, I think, Ryan, you okay to just keep going? I don't, I don't yeah, feel we're like good. A break. So let's, let's just keep moving along. Uh, let's talk now briefly about recording. Uh, that looks like a lot of different things. It depends how you capture your content. So um, I guess let, let's start more in the context of interviewing at this point. Uh, historically, I did the majority of my content using Skype and Ecamm's tool called Call, Call Recorder Pro. Um, what I liked about Skype early on is I have an external Skype number tied to my Skype account. And uh, at least back in the day when I was starting out, a lot of people like to be able to call into a phone number uh, for an interview that uh, when people were less comfortable with Skype and some of these other services. Um, so that's how I probably have done 500 interviews through the years, just using Skype, either if it was somebody calling in via phone or just connecting via a normal uh, Skype connection. Uh, in the last year or so, I've transitioned almost exclusively over to Zoom at this point uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, people are very comfortable and are pretty much know how to use Zoom very well, uh, which has been fantastic. I even find in this day and age, not everybody is very competent at using Skype. Um, so it does take away some of the frustration and complexity there. Um, even a, a free Zoom account, if it's just you and another person can record long interviews, um, you can capture 
the audio and the video. You can capture the audio in two different tracks, one for you uh, and one for your guests. It gets a little more complicated as you add more guests into uh, a Zoom connection. And if you have a free account and you have two or more guests, you're limited to that 40 or 45 minute window. So that's just something uh, to be aware of. But um, you know, Zoom, some of the sometimes the video quality and the audio quality leaves something to be desired. At times, I do a bit of post production to improve my audio. Uh, a lot of times, it'll be just a sing, uh, single track, and so I'll, I'll make sure it's set to be left and right and all the good things like that. Um, also, I guess the other other place I would or tool I would mention is StreamYard. That's what we're using uh, right now, uh, and so. Uh, that's probably the tool that I see if, if they're not using Zoom, I see people shifting over to StreamYard uh, just in the sense that people are doing all, a lot, of, especially if it's interview-based, interview based, uh, both audio and video these days. Uh, if you were going to do more of a solo show, you know, that was only audio, you could record directly into Audacity or Adobe Audition or GarageBand or if you have some kind of a, a voice recorder like a Zoom P6 or P8 or one of these other devices, you could record directly into a device like that. Um, I would say by and large, the majority of the people I'm working with are either doing uh, interview content with another person, so it's a very often video, uh, or even I've got a, a number of uh, podcasters that I've started with in the last six months where they're actually doing video of themselves teaching the message. And so we'll put out a video version and we'll also put out an audio version as well. So uh, what's going to work well for you is going to be based somewhat on the equipment you have, uh, also what kind of a show or an experience that you're trying to create. So whether it's Skype with Call Recorder Pro, or maybe it's Zoom, or uh, maybe it's StreamYard, uh, th those are kind of the three that I see pretty consistently. Uh, there's a bunch of others, like Zencaster lets you capture audio right in your browser, uh, I see people using Riverside.fm, which claims it does higher end audio and video because it does the, the processing on each machine. On, uh, so on, on your side and on your guest side, uh, I've only been a guest uh, via Riverside thus far. I've not hosted anything. So uh, there's a wide range of options. It all depends how much you want to spend. You know, Zoom, free option. Uh, that works well 95% of the time, in my opinion. Uh, when you start getting into StreamYard and other things, it can add up. An annual subscription for any one of these services can you know, cost you a few hundred bucks a year. So uh, it really depends on your budget and what exactly you want to accomplish. So uh, Ryan, any other thoughts you would have on recording? Well, on Zoom, it's free for 20 minutes and less. If you're going to go over 20 minutes, you're going to have to pay uh, a subscription per month. Uh, me personally, I use Zoom the most. I use StreamYard as well. But the one thing I will say to everybody at some point, you're probably going to have to use a bunch of them. You're probably going to have to learn how to use them all because what you're going to run into is you may have a guest that they're more comfortable in StreamYard. And so you're going to need to use StreamYard or whatever the case may be. So don't be afraid to experiment and use some of the um, availability that is out there. And they all work, like Sean said, for different reasons and what you have. So uh, you might as well learn them. Yeah, there, there, there's no lack of existing tools, and we'll see more and better tools. I mean, a year or two ago, everybody was using BeLiveTV.tv. I never hear of that anymore. Almost everybody's using StreamYard. Um, you know, I use Restream.io for a lot of my content, um, where I use I, I use Ecamm Live to restream stuff that's already been put through post production. And so, uh, there's there's a, a wide range of tools that you can use for recording and capturing. Um, even even some of the content uh, that some of the other creators I work with do that they'll put up on their YouTube channel. Or like if we use Larry Sparks as an example, he's got a show called Prophetic Life with Larry Sparks. Um, he streams it out with StreamYard. And I actually just go and go to the grab the URL for the video on Facebook uh, and just use a video downloader to grab that audio file and I turn that into his podcast for him on a weekly basis. And so uh, there's a lot of other out of the box tools and ways that you can grab content that you need, uh, you know, restream stuff that you've already put through post-production yet. It looks like it's a live video. So um, I, I don't really want to get too much into that. That's a, a little beyond the scope of what we wanted to cover today. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's no lack of ways uh, to go ahead and capture and record your content. 
Uh, next, let's talk about editing, the, the endless time suck that can be editing. Um, I would say when I started out, I over-edited. Uh, and have, I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours editing over the past eight, nine, ten years. And, um, you know, it really depends how much of a perfectionist you are. You will get better and you will get faster uh, as you move along. Uh, I feel like there is a certain grace to uh, be willing to do a one and done. You know, I, I have friends who they will do a live stream and they will grab that audio version and put that out as their podcast episode. And it's it. They don't they don't do a ton of post-production. Maybe they'll. Uh, level out the audio uh, or do some very basic editing, uh, but nothing too fancy, nothing too crazy. Uh, that kind of goes back to the time commitment you have. If you have the time to be able to do like a live stream once a week, and then you turn that into an audio piece for your podcast, well, may maybe you only have an hour to do that. That You could realistically do that in an hour, depending on the length of the show, uh, every week. So uh, sometimes one and done is great. One and done can be a, sometimes a one and done can be a great place to start to, uh, get five to 10 episodes in to find your voice and get a comfort level. Um, I always feel like when you get about 10 episodes in, you start to find your voice, your rhythm, your personality. So, um, you can get in a weird place where if you, uh, do too much post-production early on, you're going to get frustrated because it is a lot of work. It is a little bit complex. So, um, there is the option of the one and done. Um, in terms of editing, it's kind of all over the place with what people use. A lot of times it's tools that they have already or, you know, depending on the budget they have. Ryan mentioned uh, GarageBand on a Mac. Every Mac comes with GarageBand. Uh, I edited early on in GarageBand. Uh, I have friends who are very accomplished and famous podcasters who still use GarageBand because it's what they've been using since they started started out 10 years ago and it just works and they have a process and uh, it just is what it is. Uh, I graduated to Adobe Audition uh, probably about six, seven years ago. Uh, it, it does have a little bit of a learning curve, but it's uh, it's kind of a Cadillac of audio production in terms of tools and features. And um, it really can do some amazing things. Uh, a lot of people are using that. Uh, Audacity is a free open source program. It runs on Windows and Mac uh, for basic recording and editing needs. Uh, it'll get the job done. Uh, it's not as uh, fancy as Audition, but for basic editing, uh, it can definitely uh, accomplish most things that you need it to do. Uh, in terms of video editing, which is something worth mentioning, you know, if you're doing a one and done, maybe, you know, with StreamYard or whatnot, maybe you're not going to do any video editing because the live feed is a live feed and you push it out to Facebook and YouTube and you're happy with it. Um, iMovie is very versatile for basic editing. If all you need is like maybe a couple of lower thirds and drop a URL in there or some over basic overlays, it'll get the job done. It comes free on your Mac. Uh, when it comes to Windows, yeah, not 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 as friendly of free options, uh, in my opinion. I'm using Adobe Premiere Rush, which comes as a part of my uh, Adobe subscription that I have. It's basically the poor man's version of Adobe Premiere. Adobe Premiere is way too complicated for what I need to do. Uh, so Premiere Rush is kind of the most comparable editing piece that I could find uh, compared to iMovie. Uh, my biggest pet peeve with iMovie is the file sizes. File sizes it exports are way bloated and just ridiculously huge for no good reason. Um, so that, that's why I transitioned over to uh, Premiere Rush just because uh, I, I can pick whether I need it 1080p or 720 or 4K, and it gives me realistic file sizes. If you try to do high-end file sizes in iMovie, it's like, oh, that'll be 40 gigabytes for yeah, really for no uh, no good reason. So, uh, but yeah, uh, you got to find the tool that works within your budget, comfort level. Um, there's no lack of tutorials on YouTube for how to use any of the tools that we've mentioned. Um, that is one of the graces of the age that we're in where audio and video editing are so normal at this point. Uh, you know, find a software that you can afford or that you like, uh, watch a couple of tutorials and you're probably going to be ready to go. Um, you, you could spend an hour or two learning uh, and know the basics of what you need to put together a decent piece of content. Uh, Ryan, additional thoughts you would have related to editing or editing software? Yeah, for me, it's basic as can be um, only because of time. It, it is it is a rabbit hole that you will go down to look up and two hours is gone. 
you know, aside from being the podcaster and, and, and doing the interviews, I also preach. So I'm working on sermons. I also teach at two different schools of ministry. In the meantime of teaching at the two different schools, I'm also recording for an online school of ministry as well. Uh, traveling, being a husband, being a father. There's just a lot of things that you have to take in consideration. Uh, so my goal is to keep it as simple as possible until I can get somebody to do it for me. <laughs> yes, that wonderful day when we can all have somebody to work for. I'm I'm raising up a son who's starting to do more video editing, and he helps me uh, a little bit. I, the hard thing for me has been to let go of it. You know, I've been producing all my own content for nine years, and I enjoy the editing process. Um, and that that is very problematic because I want to uh, go out and just and and do the editing because I really enjoy it so much. Uh, another tool that uh, is in the, the PDF that I'll share a link to at the end of the teaching here um, is called Levelator. Uh, that is an open source tool that is kind of end of life. It doesn't work on Mac anymore. Uh, one of the reasons I have a Windows machine is solely for Levelator. Um, it is this little tool. You open it up and it's just a small window and you can drag a WAV file into it and it will level out all the audio in the WAV file. And so uh, working with a range of podcasters for the podcast network, some of who edit in uh, Audacity and GarageBand and everything else you can imagine, um, they'll send me files and, you know, their intro and outro will be really loud and their, their, like the meat of their interview will be quiet or vice versa. Um, and so Levelator has just been a fantastic tool I've used through the years uh, to just fully level out all of the audio in a track uh, that's free. Uh, it's just, it's an orphan program at this point. So, uh, it won't work, work on Mac anymore, but it does work great on windows. So, uh, that's one I can recommend. I use it almost every day. Uh, and that will be in the PDF handout as well. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else, um, in terms of just basic editing, I, I don't want to cover, uh, much related to editing cause it's kind of out of the scope of what we wanted to talk about today. But, um, you know, I, I would say don't spend more than an hour or two max on editing for, for an episode uh, because you can, you can spend three, four or five hours if you try to get too fancy. Um, if you're editing with studio headphones, remember that earbuds are very forgiving. If people are commuting, if they're in the gym or out running, listening on earbuds, they're not going to hear everything uh, as you're going to hear it in crisp headphones. Um, you know, uh, if you have breathing and just like, I, I don't like to listen to my own breathing in podcast episodes, um, so I use, <laughs> I know I got to breathe, but I, you know, I feel like I sound like a serial killer or something. Um, you know, there, there can be, uh, way, ways to take care of some of that. Um, but the, the more things you decide you want to do besides leveling the audio, just know to know that it's going to take, uh, more of your time. I'm always like, okay, is there a background noise that I need to remove? Um, you know, can I, get rid of, you know, put in a, a noise gate to get rid of audio below a certain level, just to block out background noise or just too much breathing and that sort of a thing, how that works out. That's going to completely vary by the tools that you're using. So, uh, not going to go into that. There's plenty of tutorials again on YouTube. You know, if you have your, whatever software you choose, you say, Hey, how do I normalize or level my audio or remove breathing in a recording, that sort of a thing. Uh, lots of uh, tutorials to find out there. Uh, let's talk briefly about, uh, where do your podcasts live? Uh, so you, you edit a podcast and it's ready to go. It's got to go somewhere. Uh, you're going to need some kind of a podcast server, a podcast host, a uh, wide range of options out there. Uh, I know a lot of people when they start out, get on anchor.fm. I don't have strong opinions about it. I've never used it personally. Uh, I think Ryan, didn't you start out on anchor at one point? No, I started yeah. out on Podbean. Podbean, my bad, my bad. Yeah, it's uh, a simple format, relatively cheap. So uh, that really depends on your budget. There's free to paid options out there. Um, I always recommend Libsyn. I've had great luck with them through the years. Uh, I think their accounts start at like five bucks or 10 bucks are pretty inexpensive. Um, you can have a pretty full featured in terms of storage space account for $20. Um, we run our whole podcast network off of Libsyn. If you get a pro account for a network, uh, you're talking about a substantially higher costs for all the bells and whistles that come with that. But in terms of just the average uh, person's account, uh, $20 is pretty typical. Um, wide range of options out there. Uh, 
you know, uh, again, I like Libsyn because they're tried and true. They've been around for uh, nine, nine, 10 years, uh, high availability, all that, but uh, lots of options in terms of uh, hosting. Uh, where do you want to be for your podcast? Uh, pretty much Apple Podcasts and Spotify are the bulk of the market. Uh, as I look across uh, all the statistics I see for our, our podcast network where we're running 12, 15 shows right now, um, probably if, if you add together the pod or the Spotify and Apple traffic, it's still probably 80% or more of all podcast downloads on the network. So, uh, you know, there's a wide range of places like uh, Amazon slash Audible can host your podcast now or not host it, but that's a distribution subscription point. Um, and there's a whole wide range of other places. Your podcast should definitely be as many places as it can be discovered, certainly. Uh, but practically speaking right now, Apple and Spotify are pretty much where everybody uh, is downloading and subscribing to podcasts. Uh, let me see. We're, we're kind of getting to the, the time where I, I want to get into Q&A. So start thinking about uh, the questions you have and we will jump into Q&A. Uh, let me just take a second to look down my list here about any other uh, quick hit things I want to mention. Uh, website. Do you need a website? Uh, if you have a website for yourself as a ministry leader, author, personality, uh, you should probably have a podcast page uh, on your site somewhere. Uh, do you need to do a post for every episode if you have the time? Yes. I see people who just point to where you can download the podcast. So, uh, depends on the complexity of what you want to do there. Uh, you should definitely have a website just so you can be found in Google and people can go to your site to find out how to contact you. Uh, but if you just wanted to have a podcast and you want to deal with having a webpage, you could just have a podcast and promote it on social media. Uh, and that is going to be fine. Um, in terms of promotion, wherever the tribe you're trying to connect with on social media is, that is where you should promote your podcast. Uh, for me, I'm pri primarily promoting on Twitter Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I see people trying to promote in other places, but uh, th those are the ones that, that work best for me. That's where my audience is uh, that I'm trying to connect with. So wherever your audience is, I guess I promote on LinkedIn too uh, as well. Uh, if you have an email list, promote there. Uh, you know, if you do a, a bunch of episodes a week, don't drive your email list nuts by sending out an email for every single uh, podcast. Uh, maybe a weekly summary or twice a month promote your top episodes or new episodes. Uh, if you're part of the Destiny Image Podcast Network, we do a, a weekly uh, email newsletter that goes out to about 210,000 people. And so we feature three episodes each week. And so that's one of the ways that we put our podcast uh, in front of more folks. Uh, but email email lists is still, whether you're, you know it's promoting your podcast or your book, uh, an email list is something crazy important uh, to build, uh, video, uh, do video. If you can video is great for discoverability. Um, I have people who only listen to my show or watch my show. If it's on a Facebook live stream, cause it's where they see it. They see it where they're just going about their normal social media consumption. So if you can do video by all means, uh, stream it out to Facebook, uh, make sure it goes up on YouTube and where, wherever, uh, your tribe might listen to video. I highly recommend doing video just because uh, it is great for discoverability. Uh, one last comment I'll make for editing is just uh, be sure you're taking notes when you're editing. If somebody had an amazing quote, uh, something that you could turn into a meme or use for promotion, uh, do that there. When you're recording an interview, if there's some kind of a goof or uh, something that you're going to have to edit out later, note the timestamp of where you are in the recording or process because that will save you some time um, in editing. And then the last question I would say, uh, or topic I want to touch on before we get into Q&A uh, would just be monetizing because that, that's a question a lot of people have. Uh, it can be really hard to monetize anything early on uh, just because uh, people want to pay you ad dollars because you're getting downloads and putting their content in front of folks uh, who might want to take advantage of an off offer. Uh, early on, uh, you can you know promote Audible or some of these other programs where maybe you'll get five bucks or what have you if somebody clicks through your link. Uh, some of those affiliate programs can be an easy place to start. Uh, if you're looking to have somebody buy advertising into your podcast, uh, some of the larger offerings, uh, those are, you know, those folks are looking for a minimum of 10,000 downloads a month, preferably 30, 40, 50, 100,000, something, you know, uh, 
they're looking for a, a lot more ears. Uh, so uh, to get into some of the higher level monetization, you're going to need to be somewhat established. Um, if you have a YouTube channel and you can break that thousand subscribers barrier, you can get some monetization there. Uh, I see people doing Patreon a, as a way to get people to sponsor their show. I've been experimenting, experimenting with buymeacoffee.com, which is a quick, easy way to give people an option to support your show. And thank you for everybody who's bought me a coffee. I do uh, appreciate that. Um, so yeah, in terms of why, you know, your why of podcasting, it probably shouldn't be uh, to uh, make money. As my wife would tell you, Sean's made very little money from his podcast. Although at this point in the journey, uh, I do make a little bit here and there with some of the things I have going on. Um, what the big wins for me in terms of uh, what's been meaningful is relationships. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's fed into job opportunities, speaking engagements, TV appearances, uh, a whole wide range of different stuff. So, uh, you know, it wasn't directly money related, but it has touched or taken me to other places that have impacted me monetarily uh, throughout my career. So uh, any any comments you want to throw out related to any of that, Ryan, before we get into q and I think you covered it. All right. Well, let's uh, let's see what what kinds of questions people have. Uh, let me go back there. All right, folks, what do you want to know? I am scrolling down. I see no questions right now. So, folks, we, we need you to ask us questions. We've still got 16 minutes, uh, and I would love to answer any questions uh, I saw, that you might have. I saw one. You may not. It came up. and may, You may not see it. It said uh, from Kara Carr, for beginners, what should you be listening for to edit? Blank Ooh. space, pops. Oh, I, I missed that. Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, certainly the blank space that can be interesting. If you have like a gap of like five seconds or 10 seconds, that can be weird. Um, definitely the, the pops, if you're, uh, too close to your microphone and, and it's picking up all your P sounds, um, you might want to get some kind of a windscreen or back off the microphone a little bit. That can certainly help. Um, you know, I think you really need to think through the, what drives you crazy when you listen to a podcast. Um, and so, uh, that, that'll, that'll probably tell you what would be good to edit. But uh, the things I'm always looking for is normalizing the audio so so that I sound at the same level as the guest. That's important. Um, if there's, you know, somebody bangs something or drops something, if I can drop that out of the recording, I'll certainly go for it. Um, you know, I, I do. Now, now the, the win for me is I'm often only speaking about 10 to 15 minutes in a recording versus the guest is speaking the rest of it because it's an interview. So it's easier for me to go through and clean up my audio um, uh, to be a little bit more determined with that and do a little bit more basic editing on my guest audio track. Uh, a, a lot of a lot of the issues in terms of the recording on your side, you can clean up by tweaking your your mixer board, your microphones you know, where, how it is in proximity to you and just kind of your environment settings as much as you can control that to improve the sound um, that can make a big difference. But uh, the things I would look for is just audio level breathing or other weird loud sounds uh, that might pop through. If your dog is barking outside, that's just podcasting from your home or occasionally I'll hear a kid making noise when I'm recording something. And sometimes I can't clean that up and it's just, it is what it is. And so, uh, yeah, you, you make the best with what you have to work with. Uh, I think people are a little more forgiving, especially as we've all been locked down doing all of our content from home and uh, people are just, you know, listening to more and more, watching more and more content. Uh, people realize we're working out of our own spaces. And so there is kind of a, uh, a more organic element of just, you know, you got kids, you got pets, whatever. Uh, you know, th think of all the people who have cats walking by the screen uh, on their Zoom recordings. So, so yeah. Um, or, or, you know, if you put a piece of content out there and once you get some momentum, you could even ask your, your listeners for feedback, you know, what would they like to see or, uh, or just, you know, have, have a few people who are podcast aficionados, listen to your recording and just give you some insight on what, what to look for and whatnot. Um, I've had a number of the podcasts I work with on the network, uh, send me some of their early recordings and I'll give them some feedback on what they can do to improve it. So uh, you know, the quality is going to vary by your environment, your equipment. Um, if you're using StreamYard or Zoom or whatever, that's going to impact what, you know, the quality of what you capture. So uh, a lot of factors to think about there. I, I would say this, um, for me, the audio side, dead air is a killer. 
And so editing, I, I will edit out dead air. However, I typically don't do it on the video side because you can see what the guest is doing. If they hesitate and they're really pondering a thought and answer, seeing that dead space, it can be permissible if, you know, according to the situation or the circumstance, and I may leave it in the video version, whereas the audio version, I would edit it out because the, the worst thing that can happen is when you're listening to something and you just pick up dead air, you think, oh, the show dropped or it messed up or whatever the case may be, and people check out. So you may run into that in some editing, the difference between editing the audio and the video side of it. And uh, going back to editing as well, the, you, there's you know some tricks you can learn even on the free stuff but that's just you got to work through it all yeah and ryan brings up a good point about the difference of audio and video editing uh for my workflow so i capture 90 percent of my content in zoom uh, i will pull in the separate audio tracks and edit my track edit my guest track align them properly mix them together uh and then what i do is i will go in uh, open the video file and then my edited audio track in Premiere Rush and I will remove the track that was included with the video and uh, attach my edited, normalized, good sounding audio to it. Uh, and then I'll, you know, cut off anything I need to. So that, that's my normal workflow. Um, you can get into situations where your audio and video tracks are kind of out of sync where I think something happened with Zoom, there was a glitch and you can't use your edited audio recording and then you're just gonna have to go with what um, is attached in the video file. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess one last thing I would say uh, about video editing and I lost my place. What did I wanna say about video editing? Um, oh, uh, doing video has caused me to have more grace and to be just a little bit more flexible uh, <laughs> with what I'm doing. Because as Ryan said, there's some things you just can't, if you try to remove it to, out of the video, it's going to be really goofy. Uh, if you're using Zoom, one of the good things is the camera is transitioning. Typically, if you're using the speaker view, it's transitioning between you and your guest. And so if there's something you need to cut off, it's not going to be awkward if you cut out a part of the clip and it transitions to you or the, or the guest. Uh, if you're doing more of a side-by-side -side view like we're doing right now, that's where it gets more complicated for editing. Because if I'm on the screen all the time or Ryan's on the screen all the time, um, it's, it can be obvious if, you know, our mouths are moving, but it's not, it's not there in the audio track. So, uh, it, it kind of depends how you're capturing the video, uh, for what you would do there. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would actually say by being forced or choosing to do more video, it's caused me to do less editing because the complexity of trying to overproduce the audio and then attach it to the video, you can create, uh, more problems for yourself. Uh, again, if you just want to do a one and done normalize the audio and just move on uh you'll probably be happier than ryan and i are and you'll get a lot more accomplished so um so sometimes it's a season where i just have a lot of content to do and i force myself to do a little bit less editing um because i need to get through i think the mo most interviews i did last year was like 44 in a month which was kind of insane um but it's not like anybody called me or emailed me and said man i listened to episode 577 and it was terrible like oh my gosh you didn't spend enough time in post-production so uh often i think we're harder on ourselves uh than than other people are going to be on us did you see sarah young's question i am looking what do you look for when choosing a guest to interview Ooh, we should talk about how to find a guest how to connect with guests um for me it's kind of what i'm i'm very shiny object as my podcast introduction says um I'm looking for something that is just interesting to me. Um, you know, I've done 800 and some interviews at this point. Doing an interview about a Christian book feels kind of like riding a bike. Uh, so those are super easy for me. Uh, the, what's challenging for me right now is talking to people in, in the mainstream space or the secular space or people who operate in business and marketing space. Um, so for me, I, I love the challenge because it gets me outside of my world that I operate in professionally on a day-to-day -day basis. So I get excited about that. Um, you know, I think some, uh, I guess the, uh, that, that's kind of a complicated answer, but I'll, I'll answer briefly. Um, you know, if I have something I'm passionate about, or I feel like God's moving on something, breathing on something, I will seek out uh, 
authors who've written certain books or people who I know can talk to a topic. And just Ryan and I have done a number of talks like this in the last six months where we're just going after things that we see happening in, in the culture, in the church, or we'll bring together friends, uh, leaders who will join us in speaking to a topic. So sometimes that's what gets my attention. Um, I'm constantly looking to see what's trending on Amazon. I regularly get into bookstores as much as I can and just look for things that um, are interesting to me and uh, figure out, is there a way I can have a conversation about that? That would be interesting to people. Um, you know, I'm working on my first book right now. And so I'm looking for authors and guests who might have wisdom or things that could speak into what I'm writing about right now. So uh, there's a lot of different reasons uh, why I might choose something. Um, I try to give as much preference as I can to the Harrison House and Destiny Image authors because, um, you know, I want to serve them any way I can and put them in front of as many people as I can. So lots of different reasons for why I might choose who to interview. Uh, you know, Ryan, besides me constantly texting you and emailing you with guest ideas, how do you decide who you want to interview? Uh, because I have a little bit of a diversity, uh, you do forward some, uh, phenomenal people and I'm always intrigued by those and I'm always willing to do them because of the wide variety of backgrounds. But so I do that, but my favorite, my favorite guest is to interview is someone who is willing to push the envelope, someone who is willing to challenge the status quo of Western Christianity someone that is not afraid to be a little bit of controversial. Um, I, I really, my ideal guest to interview is somebody who is not willing to tiptoe around things, but just say what needs to be said. Uh, so those are the individuals I'm always willing to go after and pursue and, and let's, let's go after those. Everyone's not like that. A lot of people are, very uh topical or they're staying in their lane and i love that i respect that and honor that and i really want to have them as guests i'm very open in that but ideally you know i i want someone to challenge i i i want that challenge out there I, it's how i think it's how i process things um i just don't accept things for the way that they are uh, I want to know that I know that it is scripture and let's go from there. So I want that kind of guest to interview as well. And I guess one further comment I would make uh, regarding guest selection is how do you actually connect with a guest that you would like to have on your show? Now, for me, as somebody who worked as a publicist behind the scenes and on marketing teams, I know that there are people in PR roles at all of the major publishers whose sole job it is, is to put their authors in front of media outlets of all kinds. And so um, it is good to build relationships with publicists at uh, the various different publishers. Um, depending on who you're asking for or what you're asking for, uh, it is not uncommon for a higher profile guest to have them ask you for your download statistics or what your reach is. That just comes with the territory. So there, there are times even nine, 10 years in where I still get shut down. Uh, because an author has a limited amount of time. They've got bandwidth for 10 interviews. And if they've got, you know, people with shows the size of Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan or whatnot knocking on the door, well, they're going to, you know, want to reach the maximized number of folks that they can. So uh, you might get shot down and you just suck it up and go, well, well, thank you so much. And I appreciate the quick response. And if something else opens up, please let me know. And every now and then they'll throw you a bone because an interview got canceled and they're just looking to fill a slot. Um, but I would say that relationship you build with the publicist over time uh, really can pay a lot of dividends because once they get to know you as a reliable person who follows through and does good interviews, uh, they'll, they'll start pitching you stuff and put you on their email list and put you on their mailing list uh, for books. Uh, I would, the other thing I would say in terms of it, it can be pretty easy if you like go to Google, search publicist Thomas Nelson, publicist Bethany House. Uh, most publishers have uh, a contact page for the various publishers for their different imprints. Or um, if there's a, a product page for the book, a lot of times there'll be a press kit there somewhere. Usually it'll have the phone number or email address of the publicist. So just, just a little bit of Googling, hitting up a few websites can be an easy way to find that information. Uh, or if you know other people like Ryan or myself who do podcasting, do interviews, uh, send us a note or a Facebook message. We can probably connect you with a publicist. I help people regularly find who's the right person to talk to to get that author. Um, maybe go to the author's website. If they have a contact page, that can be a way to get a foot in the door. 
uh, or Twitter. I found direct messaging on Twitter can be a really easy way to get an author's attention. So uh, there's a lot of ways. Uh, keep your requests short, simple. Uh, you know, say what you what, what you want. Um, use Calendly. I find uh, publicists appreciate that because they don't just like it's a win for me uh, when I don't have to do 10, 15 emails back and forth to schedule a show for a publicist to be able to hand their author that link and they can schedule it and it's just done. Um, that's a win for them too. So you really want to uh, keep it short and make it as simple as possible for them to say yes and get it scheduled. Um, and if, if somebody cancels or has to reschedule, that happens. Don't take it personally. If they can't reschedule, uh, come back around at a different time. Um, and, and even in terms of high profile authors or any author, the best time to get them is when they're promoting a book because they want to be out there front talking about it, getting that book in front of as many people as possible. Uh, so when somebody has a new book launching, that can be the easiest time to get somebody who's maybe several steps out of your circle of friends and acquaintances. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, creativity, a little social engineering and research. Uh, and you'd be amazed at the, the opportunities you, you can get. Um, even if you want to talk to people, um, I talked to a number of people in like the conservative political space last year, definitely outside of my sphere of influence as a podcaster in the Christian space. Uh, yet I was able to book a number of high profile people with big radio shows and podcasts last year, simply because I asked. And so, uh, you never know. And as you get those higher profile guests, I, I regularly use those when I, uh, reach out and pitch myself and be like, Hey, well, uh, I interviewed Matt Walsh last year and this person and that person last year as a frame of reference. And so, um, as you slowly build up that body of work and get higher and higher profile guests, uh, a lot of times if they go, oh, well, you're already talking to people in our sphere, in our space, uh, that in and of itself can open a lot of doors. So uh, if, you, if you want more insight or feedback on how to uh, book guests, find guests, connect with publicists and authors, uh, just drop me a message. I'm, I'm glad to give you some additional feedback or insight, but um, it's not as hard as you think. You just have to know how to communicate effectively with those folks. All right. Uh, John wants to know what video software you are using. So right now for this event, uh, obviously the event is hosted through Facebook through their paid events service that they've recently added. Uh, for that, you have to host it on a Facebook fan page. Maybe at some point they will add it to personal accounts, but right now uh, it's only tied to fan pages. So that is how you all are connected to us for this um, in terms of the interface we're using to capture it, uh, we are using StreamYard right now, um, which has a free option that's somewhat limited uh, and then several different tiers of paid options. So uh, in terms of streaming software, StreamYard is pretty much the Cadillac right now. Um, if I were to recommend an all-in-one, uh, high-quality, very functional service, ease of use, uh, in the interface uh, for the person hosting it, StreamYard is uh, really the best, in, in my opinion. So uh, the paid version that you're likely going to want, uh, and what does it run, like 20 bucks a month, 25 bucks a month, something like that, if you get it on an annual basis. Yeah. Uh, other, otherwise, if somebody doesn't want to uh, use StreamYard, Zoom would be what I would probably recommend uh, as a good secondary starter option. All right, folks, we have reached uh, the end here. If somebody else wants to drop in a question quick, please let us know. I'm going to put across the bottom of the screen. I've got a little podcasting resource list. You can find that at bit.ly forward slash PDF podcasting guide. Uh, I think it's like a, a page and a half, uh, but it has links to uh, some recommended editing software, promotional tools, some of the microphones I recommend and different things. Uh, so hopefully that will be a helpful resource for you. Let's let that keep scrolling there. Uh, thank you, Cara. Appreciate you joining us uh, for our masterclass. And, and for all of you, this has just been uh, a blast. Ryan and I didn't quite know to, what to expect. This is the first time he and I have partnered up on this sort of broadcast. We've done, done a bunch of other stuff, uh, but never anything quite like this. Uh to my knowledge, now this is the first time I hosted one of these on Facebook, these videos should be available, or this video should be available in uh, the Facebook Live event interface. If you have access, you paid to view it. So if you want to go back and rewatch it, it should be available there. Um, 
I will be grabbing a recording of this and doing something with it. If you want a copy of that to have offline to view outside of the Facebook interface, I'm glad to share that with you. I just ask that you don't share that with anybody else. I will likely uh, chop these up and turn these into some kind of an e-course or some kind of other content uh, in some other spaces at some point, but you paid to be here and uh, be on the journey with us. So I want to make sure that you have that uh, available to you. Uh, if there are other questions you have, uh, things that you would love to have us talk about when we do uh, a level two talk on podcasting, where we'd get more into some of the mechanics of editing and promotion and some of the other stuff out of how do you just get started. I uh, would love to hear your insight and feedback. Uh, something that we didn't cover that you think really should be part of a an intro to podcasting talk. Uh, would love to hear from you as well. So uh, feel free to reach out, uh, give us a shout and let us know if there's any way we can improve or if there's uh, you know other things that you would find interesting for us to share about in the future, let us know. I'm going to look at the comment section one more time. I think we have pretty much covered everything. So uh, just thanks again for all of you who chose to join us for the broadcast. It's been a pleasure talking, sharing our stories, sharing from our experiences. Uh, our hope is that this gets you started in your own podcasting journey. And once you get through that initial run of 10 episodes and really get into a groove, uh, and just if you can stick with it for the long haul, I, I think it really will will be a life changing thing. I never, ever thought podcasting, uh, creating content like this would be such a big part of my personal, my professional life. Uh, yet it's one of the biggest joys I have. And I, I think Ryan would agree as well. Uh, it's really shifted uh, just the opportunities that we have, the relationships we have. Heck, Ryan and I met because we did a podcast together. And that's how our relationship got started. I mean, honestly, some of my very best friends. Uh, some of the men and women who speak into my life on a regular basis, sort of that that you know top 10 list of people I'm on the journey with, I literally met all of them through podcasting. So it's funny uh, how God has used that to actually help me find friends. So thank God for podcasting. Sean actually has some friends. Uh, Ryan, any parting or closing words, things you want to make sure uh, you fit into the broadcast? Yeah, again, thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this. And thank you all who participated in it. The one thing I would say is um, I was told many years ago about two guys that went fishing and they fished all day and caught nothing. And someone on the shore said, boy, you failed. And the guy responded, we didn't fail. We cast the line. We didn't catch anything, but we went fishing. So I'm saying this to say, don't be afraid to go fishing. Even if you don't catch anything, cast the line. You won't fail. Failing in podcasting is when you never cast the line. Cast the line and go fishing. Get in the boat and launch out. All right. I don't know that I can end this on any better note than that. Thank you, Ryan. Again, thank you to all of you for joining us. We appreciate it. We've had a blast. And uh, keep a watch out. Uh, maybe in a month or so, we'll do a level two class. We would love to have all of you join us again. If in, in the time between now and then you uh, get ready to launch your podcast and have some things set in motion, uh, we'll have a wide range of stuff to talk about in that level two class that will help you uh, get going, promote your podcast better, improve your editing, all that sort of stuff. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Have a blessed evening and we'll see you again soon.